Good afternoon, Dr. Miranda. Good afternoon, Mr. Ibarra. Can you hear us? Yes, I can. Good afternoon to you, too. Good afternoon, Dan. You made it. Yeah, I did. There was some traffic. We were a little nervous, but we actually got back in plenty of time. Okay, good, good. It's good to see you. Good to be, uh, good to be here. Do we have all the board members yet, uh, Joanne? No, we're waiting on two. We have five board members on. Okay. Hey, Antonio. How are you, sir? Doing well, sir. Thank you. Good to see you. Good to see you. And I see Melanie. Hey, Melanie. Hello there. Good evening. Good evening. And of course, I see, I don't see Lori, but I know she's on there. So just. I know she has a little presentation tonight. So, uh, and so we're missing with Ms. Haro. Is she on? Uh, I believe I just seen Ms. Haro hop on. Ms. Haro, can you hear us? Can you hear me, Joanne? Oh, yes, we can hear you, Ms. Harlow. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Are we missing Ms. Thorin Ojeda, Joanne? Yes, yes, Ms. Thorin Ojeda. Everyone else is on. Hello, Maria Amanda. I just made you a panelist. I just want to make sure that your mic works. Hi, Melanie. Can you hear me? We can. Thank you. Okay. Joanne, Ms. Thorne, I hate us having a problem logging on to WebEx. Okay. Let me see. Is, uh, WebEx is waiting for others to join. Is she in, in the correct meeting date, June 10th? Let me, yeah. Let me give her a call. Okay, and double check she's in the June 10th board meeting. Okay. Uh, Ms. Alpin, I went ahead and made you a panelist and um, I'll go ahead and put you on the stage so we'll see you the whole time. Thank you. No problem. Mr. Chang, um, I just want to make sure your mic works. I, I made you a panelist now. Yes. I'm good, thank you. I see Ms. Dorian Ojeda. Ms. Dorian Ojeda, can you hear us? Yeah. Hi, Ms. Dorian Ojeda. And Ms. Medina, I believe that's all seven board members? That is, Mr. Flores. Okay. Great. Uh, well, I've got 5.30, so we'll go ahead and, and get started. So uh, we'll call to order this meeting of the Colton Joint Unified School District Board of Education on June 10th. Uh, I'd like to welcome everybody uh, to tonight's meeting uh, virtually. Um, at this time, we'll open our meeting as we do uh, every meeting with the Pledge of Allegiance. I'd like to ask Board Member Fuentes if you wouldn't mind leading us in the Pledge of Allegiance. Let's do that. Let's stand and put our hand over our heart. Let's begin. 
I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, to the Republic, which stands one nation under God, indivisible with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Thank you for that board member Fuentes and Miss Medina, if you will take the official roll call for tonight's meeting. Sure. Miss Adigan? Here. Mr. Flores? Here. Mr. Fuentes? Uh, here. I'm sorry, I'm choking here. <clears throat> Ms. Doreen Ojeda? Here. Ms. Sandoval? Hello? Ms. Sandoval? Here. Thank you. Mrs. Haro? Here. Mr. Ibarra? Here. Thank you. Thank you for that. Let the record reflect all board members are present for tonight's meeting. Our first item of business is adoption of the agenda for tonight's meeting. At this time, uh, we have no amendments to the agenda. Is that correct, Mr. Superintendent? Uh, that is correct, uh, Board President. Thank you. So I'll go ahead and ask if there's a motion to adopt the agenda as presented by, by staff. So moved, Pat Harrell. Okay. Thank you, Board Member Harrell. Second, second? Fuentes. second by Board Member Fuentes. Thank you for that. Ms. Medina, roll call vote. Mr. Ibarra? Yes. Ms. Harrow? Yes. Mr. Flores? Yes. Ms. Doreen Ojeda? Yes. Ms. Sandoval? Yes. Mr. Fuentes? Yes. Ms. Adigan? Yes. Thank you. All right, thank you for that. The agenda is approved as presented. Our next item on the agenda is our special presentation. Tonight we have uh, employee recognition, which is uh, one of the fun opportunities we get to recognize our outstanding staff here in the district. I believe we have our director, Ms. Carlton, uh, director of HR, to lead us in this presentation. Ms. Carlton. Hi, good evening. Good evening, Board President Flores, board members, Superintendent Miranda, and members of the public. The Human Resources Division would like to con congratulate our May and June employees of the month. These individuals were nominated and selected due to their outstanding contributions and hard work. They each show dedication and commitment to making our district the best it can be. Do we have a slideshow or? See we that. do, Lori. I'm I'm dealing with something right now. Could could you just give me one second? Oh, sure, no problem. Thanks, Lori. Would you like me to continue? I'm going to let Mr. Flores make that decision. It's just going to take me a few minutes here to figure out why it's not presenting for you. Okay. Mr. Flores, would you like me to continue or would you like to wait for the... If, do you think it'll just be a, a minute, Melanie? Tell you what, why don't we go ahead? And, yeah, we'll jump into it if we if you don't mind, Lori. And then what we can do is we can play catch up with the slides if need be. So you can go and, and, and get started then. All right, no problem. So our classified employee of the month is Santiago Sanchez. He is the head custodian at Smith Elementary. Santiago was nominated for his dedication to Smith Elementary, including the staff, students, and the campus. His work is consistently stellar, and he is truly dedicated to his work. Santiago is always the first to volunteer his time and his efforts to do what is best for students and staff. Especially during these trying and difficult times, Mr. Sanchez has kept his level of enthusiasm high for the campus and without reservation. He is a hardworking employee and is well deserving of this recognition. So congratulations to Santiago. Our certificated employee of the month 
is Lisa Maxwell, teacher at Sycamore Hills Elementary School. Lisa is a dedicated and caring teacher. She is brilliant with technology and excellent at meeting the needs of all learners. Lisa has been entrusted with other staff members' children due to her outstanding teaching ability. Mrs. Maxwell has gone over and above her teaching expectations, especially this year, with reaching out to others to provide support during distance learning. She has volunteered to help with online lessons, assisting with sub plans, working with subs, and assisting with the LPAC testing for other teachers' students. She is always wonderful support to others without deserving anything without desiring anything in return. She is an amazing teacher and a caring colleague. And Lisa is the perfect candidate for this recognition. So thank you, Lisa, for all you do. My third person for today is our management employee of the month, Jose Rubalcaba. Custodial Supervisor for Maintenance and Operation. Jose is a critical pillar of support for Ruth O'Harris Middle School. He is respectful and works to meet the needs of the school. Jose works with his team to understand the site vision and to do what he can to help the school achieve their goals. Jose has the interest of students at heart and wants to provide students with the cleanest and safest campus possible. He takes the time to answer questions and assist students and families on campus. No matter the task, Jose always does his work with a positive and helpful attitude. He is appreciated for always working to respect and understand the needs of the site, carrying out his responsibilities with pride, and caring for the community. Thank you, Jose, for all you've done. We just wanted to end this with this is our last employee recognition for the year. Um, we wanted to just kind of make a statement that although only a few candidates can be selected every month. All employees of Colton should be considered employees of the month. As we end the school year, we want to relay the message that it took everyone with a coordinated effort from the sites and departments to those in the district office to enable us to have the level of success that we were able to accomplish in this extremely difficult time. This year has proven that we are truly a team and together we can accomplish anything. Thank you very much, Colton, for all you have done. We truly appreciate all the hard work have a great summer. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Carlton. Uh, I'll echo those words. This was obviously not a conventional school year in many ways. A challenging year for everyone, parents, students, and even staff. Um, a lot of our staff had to really jump in uh, and take on tasks that were probably new to them. Uh, they had to be incredibly flexible and doing that while also balancing things like ensuring they were safe, ensuring social distancing, keeping everybody healthy. So it was a, a, a yeoman's effort on the part of all of our staff this year to be as incredibly uh, successful as we have been. All these challenges is, is amazing. Uh, and while we miss um, being able to give these awards out in person, we look forward to doing that very soon. But please convey to um, tonight's awardees, Santiago, Lisa, and Jose, how much we appreciate their efforts. This award is special because you're nominated by your peers, essentially, and the staff that you work with every day. So please convey how proud we are of them. And I absolutely agree. I think our, all the board members feel the same way. We are so proud of our employees who stepped up this year in a very difficult situation and continue to work hard on behalf of our district and all the students. And we look forward to being able to have a little bit of normalcy as we begin to return to campus for summer school, of course, and then uh, our regular year beginning in August. So thank you, Ms. Carlton, for that. We appreciate it. Thank you very much. Excellent. All right, uh, that takes us to item 3.0, our public hearings. We do have two public hearings for today. Uh, the first item, 3.1, is the proposed public hearing for the proposed local control and accountability plan for 21-22. So I will officially open that public hearing, and I'll ask Ms. Medina, do we have any public comments for this hearing? No, we don't. All right, seeing that we have no public comments for this hearing, I will go ahead and close the public hearing. Uh, for item 3.1, the proposed local control and accountability plan for year 21-22. Uh, and then we'll re reconvene our regular board meeting here. We do have a, another public hearing, and that's item 3.2. This is the public hearing concerning the proposed budget for fiscal year 21-22 and fund balances above the minimum recommended reserve for economic uncertainties. Uh, at this time, I will officially open that public hearing. And I'll ask Ms. Medina if we have any public comment for this hearing. We do not have any public comment for this hearing. All right. Seeing that there is no public comment, I'll officially close the public hearing. 
and then bring it back to the board to reconvene our um, and continue with our regular meeting. That takes us to item 4.0, which is our public comment for this evening. So I will go ahead and turn it over to Ms. Medina to read tonight's public comment. Ms. Medina. Thank you, Board President Flores. Public comment number one, Lisa Villa, parent. Good afternoon, everyone. Although there are many topics of concern for me and my Colton community, I will address the most recent concern. I was deeply concerned about this topic prior to the pandemic. I have previously addressed this issue before to the principal and, and to the board, but obviously it went one ear and out the other. What is the reason that graduates are hastily rushed out of the Colton High Stadium or any venue and any of our district's graduations? With the pandemic being the excuse this year for these unsafe practices, let's point out some disturbing facts of the Colton graduation. Although you see it as we should be thankful we had an in-person graduation, it wasn't a gift. It was allowed by the CDC, not you. Our Colton graduates were required to be separated while seated when in fact, Bloomington's graduates were sitting right next to each other. Our Colton graduates were reminded of no selfies, but yet the other schools were taking selfies with administrators. No temperatures were taken. Not that I had an issue with temperature, but if you were going to be all about following CDC guidelines, then it should have been done through and through, not to your convenience. Colson High principal was throwing around graduation tickets to bribe students and to move seats, which leads me to believe the tickets were not really being counted. Where were the extra tickets for the students that didn't graduate? Why weren't those divided up? Why were our graduates escorted out to Rancho Bus Loading Zone in front of the Hub's gym and forced to be in that small confined area? So you had them separated during all of the ceremony, but then compacted them all in that small space and then added the 1600 parents and family on top of that? How was that safe? I did not want my family or myself to get COVID, so we decided to venture back for some breathing space and in order to maintain social distancing. We backed up onto Rancho Avenue, since Rancho Avenue was blocked off anyways. But then law enforcement started threatening all of our families to get out of the street because they were going to open up Rancho Avenue. Why would you allow this unsafe practice? Release over 2,000 people towards Rancho and then open up the street? There is no regard for our Colton community and their safety. What is the reason we have to leave so quickly? Is it because COVID only exists from 9 p.m. to 10 p.m.? Is it because the principal is tired and wants to go home? Because she has made that statement to me before. Is it because you don't want to pay any more overtime than you have to? What is the reason we cannot leave in a le leisurely fashion? So my family and I decided to go back to Grand Avenue where we had parked so we could try to enjoy this once in a lifetime moment for they had to immediately locked up the stadium. So we had to walk around to C Street where there were no sidewalks. I helped guide my family and many other graduates and their families dodge cars because we had to practically walk in the middle of the street because of the parked cars. This unsafe practice has to stop. This is a family community. Why can't we enjoy the graduation moment with our graduates and families? Once again, I need you to take our concerns seriously and look into this matter. Graduation is one of the most important parts of a child's academic life, as well as an educator, and the Colton School District does not make it enjoyable. This is a school, not jail. Respectfully, Lisa, B Lisa Villa, frustrated Colton parent. Public comment number two, Veronica Gaitan, parent. Good evening. I'm writing to you today with concerns regarding Colton High School and their leadership. First, I would like to address the graduation. As a parent of a senior at CHS, I was very grateful that we were even allowed an in-person graduation. To hear my daughter speak and to witness the ceremony and celebrate with the kids was amazing. Not because of the leadership, but because the students. It was their time to celebrate. That was the least we could give to those seniors. As I sat in the audience of all three high schools, Grand Terrace, Bloomington, and Colton, I couldn't help but notice a difference. The welcoming, the happiness, the celebration of Grand Terrace and Bloomington, the senior letters on the field for GT, the 21 in the back of the podium, the gesture of multiple kids addressing their class. At Bloomington, a board member paid tribute to his daughter and translated the speech in both English and Spanish. The speech lasted over 10 minutes. The confetti canyon, cannons combined with the fireworks. It was just amazing as it could be, as it should be. But Colton is in the same district. Do they not have the same rules, the same guidelines, the same expectations, the same caring leadership? Our kids were hounded from beginning to the end. For my child, the hounding started a week prior to graduation. My daughter was a senior class president. 
Her speech was to present the class gift. She was not only provided with rules nor a time limit, and in her speech, she incorporated a tribute to key people that helped Colton seniors this year, along with some motivational wording she felt important to address. Her rough draft was four minutes and was praised on it two to three weeks prior to the graduation when she turned it in. She forwarded it to a few teachers and her principal all gave her positive feedback. However, two days before graduation, her principal told her adamantly she was only afforded two minutes. The next days leading to graduation, she and I were hounded by the principal for the updated speech. The principal even threatened to find another person to present the class gift. The end result that the principal agreed to that she herself would edit the speech and my daughter would present what the principal edited it to make it two minutes. On graduation day, my daughter had to meet with the principal to receive the final draft. It was not a surprise that the part she took out was the thank you tribute to the community for supporting the seniors all year long. This is just very upsetting. My daughter felt targeted as not even her, even her leadership teacher addressed her, spoke to her, nor congratulated her the week of graduation. Because my daughter chose to take a stand and use her voice to thank not only certain people, but the entire Colton community. After watching GT allowing all their students to talk, motivate, even playing a video, paying tribute to the non-school sponsored senior events, making a video of the seniors thanking important people in their lives, at Bloomington, the board member addressing the class and his daughter with his 10 minute speech. Why do we continue to have some someone in a place of power at CJ, CHS that does not care for the best interests of these kids? This school is being ran like a prison and she's the warden. Respectfully, Veronica Gaitan. Public comment number three, Betsy Diaz, parent. Good evening, board. During this past year, I realized I was stuck under rock. I didn't realize the lack of school spirit and the lack of communication that Colton High School had. My son graduated this year and I just wanted to say we need change. Having an admin dictate a class president's speech is not okay. My son would always say to me, our principal doesn't like us and me being a school employee, I would side with the principal and trust in them. I would think that he is over overreacting. I believe that she has a lack of communication skills and lack of empathy. All year, she left us in limbo, not until the last month of school, she decided to do something for our students. I understand we were in a pandemic, but it would have helped with some form of tier of where we were at in. It was sad that our students didn't know the alma mater during graduation. If she had pride in our school, it would, it would have should, should in our students. My daughter will be a yellow jacket in a couple years. I hope there will be some form of positive change. Sincerely, Betsy Diaz. And that concludes public comment. Thank you for that, Ms. Medina. And again, thank you for everybody that uh, participated in public comment. We appreciate getting the feedback from parents uh, and community members. That concludes public comment and takes us to the next item on the agenda, which are our administrative presentations. And we do have a couple of administrative presentations this evening. Uh, the first one is actually our LCAP presentation. This is the 21-22 Local Control Accountability Plan uh, and Budget Update. So this is a joint presentation by our Ed Services Department and Businesses Services Department. So I will turn it over to Dr. Peterson and Mr. Jensen to go ahead and lead, uh, lead us off on this presentation. Thank you, Board Member Flores. Good evening, Board President Flores, Board Members, Superintendent Miranda, and members of the community. Tonight's presentation will be a combined presentation with business services on the local control and accountability plan or LCAP and the district budget. We're excited to have the opportunity to present the work of all of our stakeholders in our presentation tonight. Next slide, please. The LCAP presentation tonight will review the current status of the LCAP, the baseline metrics for our LCAP goals, and a review of the additional actions and services that are being added to next year's LCAP. Our current status includes the public hearing tonight of our new plan for 2021 through 2024 using our new metrics. As a reminder that as of 2017-18, the LCAP was fully funded so any additional actions and services that we presented and we present tonight are for the next school year and are not ongoing. The additional actions and services are the result of conversations and input from board, prior, board priorities, the 2019 dashboard results, 
and those that were available for, for the 2020 dashboard. The current state of our educational options as a result of the pandemic, LCAP survey results, the results of all the LCAP committee's works, works throughout, the, throughout the year and feedback from all of our parent advisory committees. Next slide, please. Over the past year, we presented our LCAP goals and metrics, and in April, we presented the current funded items under each goal. Tonight, we wanted to provide a deeper look at the metrics and what our current baseline measurements are that we will look to improve over the next three-year cycle of our LCAP. The first goal, Equitable Access for All, looks at baseline numbers for many of our programs that we will drill down by subgroup to assure all student groups receive access to these programs. You can see our current rates for advanced placement Pass rate at 47.4% for last year, A through G percentage, advanced placement pass rate, or excuse me, early assessment program, which supports our 11th grade students and access into their university English and math classes. Our senior pathway completion rate of 30.7%, our EL reclassification rate, which looks low right now because we do not have um, final numbers for the year and we're not able to give the LPAC summative assessment last year which is needed for reclassification. And our numbers for gate enrollment and students with disabilities that are considered in the least restrictive environment. Next slide, please. Goal number two, student achievement provides our baseline metrics. Most of these numbers come from our dashboard. The first two areas, graduation rate and our college and career readiness indicator are from last year that, and were updated on the 2020 dashboard in, in December. Our CAF math and English metrics and our LCAP progress towards proficiency are from our 2019 dashboard data as we did not give the CAF last year and did not receive the L LPAC progress reports from the state um, because we not, did not give the summative assessment. The DIBBLES, IREADY, and PSAT data is from this year. We will update all numbers in the fall or winter when results from this year become available. Next slide, please. Goal number three is our wellness goal. The metrics on the left side, chronic absenteeism, suspension rates, expulsion rates, and dropout rates, our dashboard measures, and our current from last year, the 2019-20 school year. On the right side, we have our PBIS climate survey results, LCAP survey participation, and mental health data. And these are current year numbers. Next slide, please. Goal number four includes our family and community engagement which includes increased attendance at our district parent meeting, participation in workshops and leadership training with our parents, along with our LCAP survey participation and social media reach. Our attendance at district meetings increased this year as we held all of our meetings online. Next year, we'd like to provide both in-person and online options and we'll work to provide those opportunities for our community so that we can continue um, the increased numbers and increasing the family and community engagement uh, attendance at our meetings. Next slide, please. Goal number five, access to resources is our maintenance goal, which is designed to maintain implementation of each of these metrics. As of the end of quarter three this year, we had zero findings for all areas listed and have provided professional development in curricular areas and pacing guide completion rates are current. For middle and high school, these metrics continue to increase. And at this point, the remaining pacing guides are mostly in areas that have current changes and will be updated in the next year. Next slide, please. Listed on this slide are the additions to the LCAP to be funded during the 21-22 school year. Again, these are one-time funded items and will only be funded for next year and are in addition to the items we've been funding and that were presented to the board in April. The additional items include funding for letters training for our TOAs, administrators, and second grade teachers elementary science and social studies professional development. ZFair is a science fair software. Safety supplies for classroom backpacks. Funding for special education and general education collaboration. Student field trips for each site. Uh, providing physical books for libraries in English and Spanish. Providing Kelvin, which is a social emotional learning platform. A refresh of some of our e athletics equipment mental health counseling training and extra duty pay for student services to implement programs, 
funding for iStation to expand support for professional, or excuse me, funding for iStation to, to um, support our, du our dual immersion students, secondary elective textbooks, expanded support for professional development during off calendar time without subs, additional support for high school visual and performing arts, a music first license to support band teachers and students across the district with music, additional AVID funding for all AVID programs, funding to continue our cultural proficiency and equity professional development, and our NCEE district system design partnership and implementation of the plan that's being developed. Next slide, please. The LCAP is really a never ending process. And once you finish the plan, you begin implementing and reporting on the results and then writing next year's plan. So this year's approval process consists of tonight's public hearing and the LCAP board presentation. At the June 24th meeting, the LCAP 21, 2021 to 24 plan will be an action item along with the LCAP addendum and the local indicators will be in the form of a report to the board. We will submit the LCAP along with the budget by June 30th and spend the summer working with the county to make any changes necessary to finalize the plan. The local indicators, even though needing to be completed now, will not be submitted until the fall. And then we look forward to the 2021 dashboard release in the winter, which hopefully comes in early December. The full text of the LCAP plan includes the 2019-20 annual update of how LCAP funds were spent two years ago, includes the 2020-2021 Learning Continuity and Attendance Plan, or LCP update, on how funds were spent this year, and our 2021 to 2024 budget overview for parents and overall LCAP plan, which make up the entire document that's attached today as part of the public hearing and will be approved at the next meeting. As we do a final review before approval on the 24th and some of the end of the year data comes in, there may be some small revisions that will be made um, and we will update the board on those. Next slide, please. I want to thank all of our stakeholders for their part in this process. This took the support of everyone to get completed in the short amount of time the state provided to complete the processes required this year and the ever changing nature of, of, the, of what happened this year. Um, I'd like to take a moment right now before the budget presentation to answer any questions the board may have on the LCAP. Great. Thank you, Dr. Peterson. Uh, are there questions from board members for Dr. Peterson with respect to the uh, first part of the LCAP presentation? Yeah, I just had a question or a, a comment um, regarding the SIPSAs, Dr. Peterson, that are being approved tonight uh, for the schools. Yes. Um, these SIPSAs are aligned to the district goals. Is is that correct? Yes, they are. Each of them, have, um, the, each of the sites had the goals for. Um, if you if you recall, these goals were actually set um, in 1920 um, and before the pandemic, and so they've had that time to align to those those goals as well. Okay, and each school shares these. Uh, these sips us with their school site council and has them approved and then they come to us? Yes, there is a process that they have to go through before they come to the board for approval. Okay, thank you. And thank you, Dr. Peterson. I know I've been involved a little bit in your, when I go uh, at, in meetings and I, I see how, you know, how well you, you, you know, share to, you know, with our community, what this document is, what it means and how we're moving forward with it. So. So thank you for your hard work. And thank you, Ms. Sarah, board member Arjun, for, part, for your participation as well, as well as the rest of the board. All right, thank you, board member Arjun. Uh, other questions from board members? Just a quick comment. This is board member Fuentes. Please. Dr. Pearson, thank you very much. A great report here, uh, first part of it. Uh, I'm just happy to see the attendance. I know we've been doing this virtually uh, for the for the past year or so, but I, I, I like to see the numbers. I like the numbers, they look good. I could see the engagement of our stakeholders, our parents. Uh, so that's very exciting to see that our parents are really, really involved. So I wanted to comment on that and uh, thank you. Thank you, Board Member Fuentes. Thank you, thank you. Uh, other, other questions or comments from Board Members? I have a question, Mr. Flores. Yes, please, Board Member Thornohita. 
<clears throat> this is Ms. Peterson. This is, I always tell my students, there's no such thing as a dumb question. So help me under, what is the I station for dual immersion? What, what exactly is that? So it provides resources for assessments and similar to iReady and provides the, provides those resources in Spanish and English um, to support, support that program. So it's very similar to what our iReady program does, but with, with uh, the uh, language support. Uh, maybe, but I wanted to make sure. Thank you. Nope, that is a very good question, Board Member Thornado, especially with all of the different platforms that we use and acronyms we tend to throw around. It does help to <laughs> ask those questions and get clarity. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I did have a question, Dr. Peterson, with respect to engagement. Um, a lot of the meetings obviously have taken place. The LCAP has a number of committees uh, and groups that meet. Uh, I presume most of that has been, all of that really has been online or through um, an online platform. One of the things that we learned in a recent presentation from DLAC parents is the convenience of the online platform is it allows a lot of parents to participate who otherwise might not be able to make an actual meeting, a physical meeting in person for lots of reasons, obviously. I was wondering if there's any thought or consideration given to uh, particularly committees that uh, engage parents and students to continuing to utilize a digital platform, a virtual platform, if you will, to have those meetings going into the next year uh, because it seems to really help and be very convenient for more people to get engaged than having to show up in a, in a physical space for me. And absolutely, one of our goals is to, uh, we have telepresence, uh, the ability to use telepresence technology, and uh, we're trying to set up that within our with within our SDC room and possibly the boardroom at some point uh, with, with the ability to do that for our, our larger groups to be in person as well as allow people to participate online. Um, if we can't get that set up or, or until we get that set up, uh, we would do also do extra meetings that are online. And so one of the things we also did this year was we held separate meetings in English and Spanish and, and at different times during the day and we held morning and evening meetings. So we provided um, just multiple opportunities, um, our parent engagement, manager and, and language support services that that supports that um, did a great job in in getting the message out this year and and um, providing access to meetings and so um, we do plan to continue that um, i appreciate i have appreciated in all the meetings i've been to um, the extended input from parents this year it, it, it went a long way to um, supporting the document that that you guys have to to review tonight and the, just the work of everybody involved, not just parents, but um, other communities not, and not just community stakeholders, but also our employees um, were able to, that couldn't make necessarily make it in person, were able to just hop online um, as they had, had, had time to do so. And we also recorded a lot of our meetings, which we'll continue to do and try to post them online as well. Thank you for that, I appreciate it. And again, any Whatever we can do to make it more convenient for, for folks to participate would be uh, would be welcome. So if you can keep us posted, particularly as we're able to do those meetings where you may have some present, but also have folks kind of piped in, if you will, through the um, uh, virtual platform, that would be great. So appreciate that. Um, other comments or questions for board members uh, from board members for Dr. Peterson? All right. All right. Hearing none, we'll go ahead and transition into the second part of tonight's presentation. This is the budget component. So we'll go ahead and hand it off to Mr. Jensen to go ahead and lead us in the budget conversation with respect to the LCAP. Would it be all right if I interrupt really quickly? I'm sorry. I see we have both of our interpreters here. I just want to check in with them to make sure that they're okay with um, transferring off, um, you know, coordinating together to make sure that they yeah, can. Ab absolutely. Please, please do. Yeah. Are you guys good? Our interpreters. Okay, I'm seeing thumbs up. Okay, great. I'm sorry. Yeah, On to you, Mr. A, Jensen. No, not a problem. I want to make sure that we um, we are able to have that transition run smoothly. So, not a problem. All right, Mr. Jensen, our proposed All budget. All right. Well, thank you, and good evening, President Flores, members of the board, our superintendent, Dr. Miranda, executive cabinet, and our CJUSD staff and families. Uh, as mentioned, I am Rick Jensen, assistant superintendent of business services, and together with the Director of Fiscal Services, Marie Amanda Sarabia, 
We will present the district's proposed budget for fiscal year 2021-2022. And uh, I too would like to thank the teams that were involved in building this budget. And we worked really well together with Ed Services, Student Services, HR. And uh, even though we, we were missing a key member of our team who was promoted to uh, an, another uh, to another district, I think that the I want to commend the fiscal services team for really coming together and preparing this budget within um, the assumptions and also within the timeline that they had to do this. Next slide, please. Okay, I'm waiting for my computer to catch up. <laughs> Sorry. Um, the LCAP rollover amount that was for the 1920 fiscal year, we're always one year behind as we figure out how much carryover there was from the LCAP, was about $1.5 million. So I wanted to report to the board today that uh, we didn't have time to include this amount uh, in the uh, in the budget. It was included in the LCAP, but uh, at this time it's not in the budget. However, uh, ev even with that though, we are pre reporting tonight that when you do see the budget for next uh, for the next board meeting on June 24th, it will be revised to include this 1.5 million dollars of carryover, and uh, that uh, that document will be presented as an adopted budget, and this one is a proposed budget. Uh, next slide, please. Good evening, Board President Flores, Board Members, Superintendent Miranda, Executive Cabinet, Staff Members, and Community Members. It's my pleasure to be here tonight to present the 2021-22 proposed budget, as well as the 2020-21 estimated actuals. Looking at the 2021 estimated actuals, we are estimating a decrease of 5.3 million in property taxes, which will be offset by additional state aid. Savings from ident identified vacancies are also included along with a 2% off schedule and 2% on schedule salary increase for ACE, CSEA management and confidential employees. There is also the June state aid apportionment deferral to July 2021, which is being covered by the TRAN that was borrowed to address the February through June deferrals. Next slide, please. Next, we will present the estimated actuals for this fiscal year. Next slide, please. As we compile the budget for the next fiscal year, we also estimate the final revenues, expenditures, and ending fund balances for this fiscal year. For 2021, we are estimating that the local control funding formula revenues will make up approximately 71% of the total revenues, with the remaining 29% composed of 15% in federal revenues, 10% in state revenues, 4% in local revenues. I wanted to point out that the federal revenues do include the money that we received from the first round of CARES Act payments, which includes the coronavirus relief funds, Governor's Emergency Education Relief Funds, or GEAR, and the Elementary and Secondary Schools Emergency Relief Fund, or the ESSER-1 funds. Next slide, please. At this point in the year, we're estimating that 2021 expenditures will be comprised of 77% salaries and benefits, with the remaining 23% being allocated to supplies, materials of 9%, services and utilities of 11%, capital costs of 2%, and other miscellaneous costs of 1%. If there are additional funds remaining at the end of this year in the form of program carryover, we will normally see savings in supplies and services, and this tends to make salaries and benefits become a larger percentage of the budget when we present the, un the unaudited actual report in September. Next slide, please. 
Now we will be taking a look at the budget graphs for the 21-22 proposed budget. Next slide, please. This slide represents the total projected revenues for the 21-22 fiscal year. The general fund is projected to have 321 million in revenues with LCFF making up 76% of the revenues, followed by federal revenues at 12%, other state revenue at 9%, and local revenue at 3%. Next slide, please. This pie chart represents the total projected expenditures for 21-22. The general fund is projected to have 330 million in expenses with salaries and benefits making up 76% of the general fund expenditures, while the remainder is attributed to other operating expenditures. Next slide, please. The proposed budget being presented tonight reflects assumptions included in the governor's May revise, sometimes referred to as the May surprise, and this year is no exception. Here are some significant changes observed since the January budget was presented. We have seen the Proposition 98 minimum funding guarantee increase by nearly $18 billion for K-14 school districts. The cost of living adjustment or COLA was increased an additional 1% from the 4.05% COLA to 5.07% with a little bit included here for compounding of two years worth of cost of living adjustments. You recall uh, this year we had no COLA, but this year's COLA is reflected in next year's COLA. The LCFF funding for CJUSD will increase as a result of the Super COLA by nearly $3 million. And our supplemental concentration grants, which fund our LCAP, will also increase by $6 million due to the May surprise. Our unduplicated pupil percentage for the three year average for this for the next year and the previous two years is nearly 84%. And the governor eliminated all LCFF apportionment deferrals next year, except for the June 2022 to July 2022 deferral, which the legislature is currently recommending to be eliminated as well. So we will wait to see what uh, final budget gets approved by the governor. Uh, next slide, please. We will be seeing additional one-time federal stimulus dollars in 21-22. The district is projecting to receive 17 million from the Extended Learning Opportunity Grant and 24.7 million in ESSER II funds, which are budgeted in the 21-22 fiscal year, along with an estimated 55.4 million in ESSER III funds that are budgeted in the 22-23 fiscal year. We are also seeing an increase of 4.05% in the AB 602 Special Education Target. Due to the STRS and PERS rates not being finalized when the budget was built, the rates used in the proposed budget differ from the rates proposed in the May revise. The proposed budget used the rates of 15.92% for STRS and 23% for PERS. The rates proposed in the May revise, 16.92% for STRS and 22.91% for, for PERS, will be reflected in the 45-day budget revision. The 21-22 proposed budget also includes the rest restricted routine maintenance account calculation, which is 3% of the general fund expenditures, including the 3% RRMA. Next slide, please. For ease of presentation, we are showing our multi-year projections in graphical form. Here we see that there is a small deficit in each of the three years of the projection as noted as the difference between the two tallest bars, the revenues in gray and the expenditures, the taller bar in blue. This deficit whittles down our ending fund balance in our general fund from $45.7 million at the end of this year, as denoted by the first yellow bar on the left, down to $21.8 million in the third year, represented by the last brown bar on the right. 
Maria Amanda will share reasons for continued budgeted deficit spending in a couple of more slides. Next slide, please. Oh, excuse me a second, I just lost my place. Okay, some highlights of the multi-year projection are, the district maintains the minimum reserve for economic uncertainties of 3% each year. As mentioned in the previous slide, a small structural deficit does exist in each of the three years. The district is establishing a sinking fund for future vehicle, bus, athletic, uh, athletic field, playground equipment placement, and future deferred maintenance needs. And we are using some of the one-time ESSER funds for additional custodians to support higher level of disinfecting when students return and additional teaching positions in order to reduce combo classes to help with learning loss mitigation. The board does not certify whether the budget is positive, negative, or qualified at this time. Instead, the county office will review the budget and either approve it, approve it with conditions, or disapprove the budget. Certification is only done during the submittal of interim reports. Next slide, please. Due to declining enrollment, increase in health benefit rates and pension rates, along with special ed cost increases, deficit spending is projected to continue for all three years of the multi-year projections in the unrestricted general fund. The spending of restricted program carryover, which is budgeted in the 21-22 fiscal year, increases deficit spending for the restricted general fund due to the revenues already being recorded in the previous fiscal year. In total, we see a deficit of 11.1 million in 21-22, 3.5 million in 22-23, and 9.1 million in 23-24. Next slide, please. In this slide, we are looking at enrollment and ADA trends uh, from the previous six years and uh, projecting for the next four. This is information we have shared with the board in previous inter interim presentations. Uh, the top line represents enrollment with actuals in black and projections in orange. The bottom line represents P2 ADA as of April each year, and we're always funded on P2 ADA. The middle line in blue shows funded ADA. Now, this is the ADA from P2 of the highest uh, year, uh, either previous fiscal year or the current fiscal year, on which our LCFF state apportionment is based each year. Next slide, please. As you follow the blue line, you may notice that the gray line in 1920, the blue line in 2021, and the blue line in 2122 all are on the same point meaning that school districts this during this past couple of years are held harmless for three years at the same ada as provided in the uh, 2021 state budget act which is great for districts in declining enrollment like colton however continue to follow the blue line to 2223 and you will see a large drop in funded ada which drops by around 1,250 accumulated ADA. As we were being held harmless for this past three years, including next year, the actual P2 ADA kept dropping in the background until 22-23 when the hold harmless protection ends. And we then revert back to using the higher of current or prior year ADA for funding the LCFF. Next slide, please. Um, next slide, please. This was one slide that I was talking about where the three years in a row are uh, for 1920, 2021, and 21, 22 were all the same. Okay. Then we drop 22, 23. Okay, so this was the slide we were talking about. Okay, next slide, please. 
There we go. Uh, this slide shows us the minimum classroom compensation percentage for estimated actuals and the proposed budget. Education code 41372 requires unified school districts to spend 55% of their expenses on salaries and benefits for teachers and instructional aides. The percentage for the estimated actuals is projected to be 55%, which meets the education code. However, the percentage for the proposed budget is projected to be 54.46% and will be monitored throughout the year. Next slide, please. At this state, at the state level, the legislator's version of the budget is due by June 15th, and the governor has until June 30th to sign or veto it. At the local level, the public hearing for the 21-22 LCAP and budget is tonight, with adoption taking place at the June 24th board meeting. The district is beginning the preparation of the 2021 unaudited actuals and will prepare the 45-day revision after the governor signs the State Budget Act. Next slide, please. Thank you for your time and attention during this presentation. And now we would like to uh, send this back to President Flores to take this opportunity to answer any questions that the board may have. Absolutely, thank you for that. We appreciate the presentation. Lots of information. So we'll, what we'll do is we'll go ahead and jump to any questions board members might have um, about uh, either um, what was presented on the close out of 2021 uh, or 2122 proposed budget. So any questions from board members? I I have a few, Mr. Jensen. I'll I'll jump I'll jump in and, and maybe I'll get to a few other folks going with questions. But um a couple of things. Uh on the with respect to the 2021 budget, um, and again, these are these are estimates with respect to the actuals, what we think will when we finally close out that budget, so to speak, uh, for this current fiscal year. Um I just out of curiosity noted that there was a five point three million dollar decrease in property taxes, is what we're estimating for this for this fiscal year, is that correct? That's mainly because we're not allowed to budget for RDA taxes until they actually show up. So we ex anticipate another $5 million probably in June, but they haven't okay. fixed already. And that's typical. And so we can't include it until then. But as you know, um, even if we get a decrease in property taxes, the state will backfill that so that we're kept uh, whole. Yeah, no, and, that, and that's right. I just was a little interesting given where assessed valuations are, property values are continuing to go up, up, up. So that looks, that sounds like that's more of a technicality with respect to factoring the RDA. Uh, okay, so that makes sense because until we have that number, we we can't we can't include that in the estimate. Okay, I appreciate that. I was a little confused because. That does affect things if there is a change in assessed valuations, like our bond measure issuances and bond capacity, et cetera. But right now, that deficit is is uh, has more to do with the RDA than it does with, let's say, overall assessed valuations in the district. Absolutely. Okay. Um, with respect to this coming fiscal year, the 21-22 budget, you made a reference to um, establishing some, some funds so we can address some capital needs that we have, uh, facility needs, uh, vehicle replacement. Um, this is important, I know. Uh, one of the larger expenses that we have uh, have to do with the athletic facilities, the fields, particularly for our high schools. Uh, replacing those is quite expensive um, and making sure that we're on a routine. Um, my understanding is they last about 10 years typically uh, through regular wear and tear. Uh, Grand Terrace High School is coming up on its 10th year, 11th year, I think we're going into technically for Grand Terrace High School. So that would be uh, in the cycle, I hope, for repair and replacement of the athletic field and track. Is that something that we're going to have factored in for all of our schools and we're putting money away so that when the lifespan of that facility reaches its, its term, if you will, we have the capacity to replace it without taking that whole hit in a single year? That is the, the plan. And of course, if there are state matching funds, we would certainly uh, apply for those. Uh, if there are other dollars other than general fund dollars, we would certainly uh, apply those dollars if we're allowed to. Uh, otherwise, we are currently setting aside the um, general fund, ending fund balance right now 
to start showing that we're trying to plan for those future large expenditures. So uh, we can, we're, our plan is to set this aside in a special reserve fund so that it can build there, accumulate interest and, and grow to the point where we'll have the funding available to do these large expenditures, just like you're saying. Okay, I would appreciate that. And I know that we had this conversation a number of years ago when we had to replace the Colton High School uh, field and, and track. Um, and the conversation was essentially, we know that they last about 10 years. So uh, immediately after replacement, we begin putting money away so that at year 10, we have the money saved to do that and getting those on the schedule. So I appreciate that. And then lastly, this is actually probably for board correspondence. Uh, if you wouldn't mind maybe sharing with us in board correspondence with respect to our fund balance, um, I think it indicated for this coming uh, fiscal year. So 2020, 21, 22, we are estimating a, a beginning fund balance of approximately $45 million. I was just curious if you could show with, share with us in board correspondence uh, what our end fund balance has been for, let's say, the last five years, something very simple as that, just kind of where we've ended the year so we can get a bit of a trend line, if you will, of that fund balance. Um, as we know, it's um, not it's not atypical for us to see a deficit built into the budget, but uh, depending on what happens throughout the year, changes, expenditures, um, revenues that may come about, um, we see those adjustments made towards the end of the year. So that's something you can share with us and board correspondence. I appreciate it. Will do. Great. I had one question. Yes, please, Ms. Adegin. Yeah, yeah um, Mr. Jensen, you mentioned that uh, the in, the certification are only submitted or we receive one only during the interim reports? Yes. Okay, when, when was the last one we had? It was a few months ago. It was, like? it was the second interim report and that that was uh, for with for data as of January 31st, 2021, and it was presented to the board uh, in March, and that was a positive certification. Positive. Okay. And um, when is our next one? Our next one will be uh, the first interim report for the 21-22 fiscal year with expenditure data through October 31. 2021, and then we'll present that report to the board in December. In December, okay. Okay, uh, thank you for that. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you, board member. Uh, any other questions from board members for uh, Mr. Jensen? All right, okay, sounds like we are, uh, we're good then, we'll go ahead and uh, we'll go ahead and close this portion of the presentation. I want to thank uh, Mr. Jensen and Ms. Uh, Saravia for the presentation. Um, as always, very detailed and we, as we know, uh, is is uh, apt to change as the state uh, finalizes its budget, of course, and other potential revenues with related uh, with really in relation to COVID may, may become available um, and or facilities uh, funding that may become available to us. So I know it's subject to change and you'll keep us in the loop as things as things change. We will do that. Yes. Thank Great. You. Thanks so much. Appreciate it. All right. Well, that concludes our presentation on. Oops, excuse me. That concludes our presentation on the LCAP and it takes us to uh, our action items for this evening. And so uh, tonight we have a number of action hey. items. We have action items six. Four, point uh, oh. We have uh, one more presentation. I'm sorry. I'm jumping ahead. You're absolutely right. Apologize for that, Doc, uh, Dr. Miranda. Thank you for the reminder. Um, I'm jumping jumping ahead, looking at my notes. Uh, we have uh, presentation 5.1. This is actually a really important presentation. I'm grateful for the opportunity to share this tonight uh, with the community. This is our grand reopening uh, with a focus on SEL practices. So student services will lead this, Mr. Dade. Uh, and I believe we have Mr. Castro as well who will assist with this presentation. So this is an important one with respect to the grand reopening for our school. So I'm gonna turn over to Mr. Dade. Thank you very much and uh, good evening board president flores board members superintendent miranda and all of those who have joined us um, this evening online um, i will be joined by mr antonio castro who is our behavioral and mental health manager to help me or assist me with this presentation uh, this evening as we all are aware in in previous years 
um, our certificated staff, our classified staff, and our administrative staff have ensured that the first day of school um, was, a, was a grand and, and great welcoming back of students and staff to set the tone for the opening of the school year. Well, due to COVID-19 um, restrictions and school closures over the last, over for over a year now, um, we've realized that there are preschool and kindergarten students who have never visited their school campuses. There are middle school students who have never visited their campuses, as well as our high school students. And there's some staff who have never been on, on our property as well. Um, and so we also have been notified by our local legislators and California legislators that we need to prepare for a full in-person return for our, our fall, fall of this upcoming school year. And so I, I believe in, in our, everyone on the executive cabinet um, believes that that calls for a grand celebration. And so we're, we titled that grand reopening. Um, and what grand captures is that this reopening um, celebration will include a couple of days prior to school starting and multiple days throughout the school year. So it's not just a one day celebration, it's a, it's a, a school full year celebration, full school year celebration. And so next slide, please. So to kick off the school year, to welcome back staff on July 29th, we will host a drive through lunch, which will include a team building accessory for all district office staff. On July 30th, um, executive cabinet and other members of our, our extended team, administrative team will be delivering lunches to, which will include a team building accessory to all elementary and secondary sites. On August 2nd, we will be hosting a drive through lunch which will include a team building accessory for all preschool staff. Next slide, please. So lunch will be provided by Jersey Mike's. Um, Jersey Mike has graciously offered their services um, and will be a part of um, each of those celebrations. Um, and it'll, the lunch will include the infamous uh, sandwich that Jer Jersey Mike makes um, with their infamous cookie and chips and a drink. Um, also, staff will receive a one of a kind. You cannot buy this online. You can't find it in any store t-shirt um, that we will utilize to capture the grand reopening um, celebration throughout the school year. Next slide, please. And so on August the 4th, we'll be welcome, welcoming back all of our students and staff and parents um, to a full in-person return. Next slide, please. So also, and we wanted to do this and grant also captures that this is district wide. So we set a, a minimum of what we what we would like for each site to look like and to, you know, what presentation they should have to welcome back students and staff and parents. And this is all done through a committee of administrators and, and others, um, other staff members across the district. So all school sites will be provided with signs and banners for display on the first day of school. All school sites will have balloon arches and balloon columns at their entrances of their schools with their school colors. All school sites are planning a variety of other morning festivities to welcome students back in style as well. And, and that is where they'll be able to take that to the next level and cater to the needs of, of their staff and communities. Next slide, please. And so that concludes this portion of the presentation in regards to the grand reopening of CJUSD for the 21-22 school year. I'd like to pause just for a moment for any questions. Questions from board members for Mr. Day. Uh, Mr. Uh, President, board president, I have a question. Mm -hmm. Not a question, Please. I have a comment. I'm really excited for this. I, I think everybody will be so happy to be there and it's just the, the icing on the cake that we're all going to be back to school and a really a great time to celebrate. So I thank the committee and, and the cabinet for making this happen for all of us to get a good start for the next school year. Thank you. Thank you for that, uh, Board Member Fernanda. Other questions from board members? Yeah, Board Member Fuentes here. Please. Just wanted to say, Brandon, great. This I'm excited too. I think. Uh, like Joanne said, you know, this is exciting times. Getting back to school, just to see the kids here at summer school was great to see that also. But I think when we open back in August and to see all the good things that are happening and get get these kids excited to come back to school, I'm very excited. So thank you, Brandon, for all you've done, your hard work, your team, 
for what you're doing and uh wow can't wait till this happens thank you thank you board member fuentes other comments or questions i just want to say thank you also to um to antonio and to um, brandon for this for the work that put in they put in um uh, to prepare um and i know it was a team effort i know you had input from principal from teachers and uh and you came up with a very very well structured plan um and um you know it, it i was at cooley the first day of summer school and as the kids were coming in the staff had their signs and sprinkling happiness and you could just see the joy in the kids faces and along with that you know some kids were okay they just kept walking down the sidewalk with their backpacks and uh and yet we did have some that were hesitant. Um, and, and those are the kids that I worry about. Uh, there were, you know, those, and you would think it was kindergartner, uh, you know, we had never been to school. No, we had, you know, I, I had to you know, talk to a, a fourth grader who she just could not step onto campus. She just could not do it. And she was, and her mom was very worried. And so we sat outside for a while and I know there are kids out there that are going to be struggling with that. And um, and Antonio and Brandon, I, I really appreciate that. We are going to be looking at these kids that really need that support, and you know, and and they need to feel welcome, and you know, and and uh, and safe. So uh, very very important, very important plan here. So thank you so much, and I'm um, I'm looking forward to the implementation of it. And um, you know, and, and um, uh, you know, just as I'm driving around, I see the, the school buses and, and it just fills me with joy. And I mean, they look like huge Twinkies. I said, you know, they're Twinkies just driving around and they have our precious cargo in, in those uh, buses. And so, gosh, this is, this is good. Thank you so much for, for this report. Thank you. Thank you, Board Member Madigan. Other comments or questions from Board Member? Uh, this is Frankie Barra. I'd just like to make a quick comment, please. Yes, please, Mr. Barra. Yes, yes. Uh, I, I did know everything that my colleagues have just mentioned. I think that uh, having uh, this opening day, reopening, is an excellent idea. And it's going to give uh, a big boost in the arm to the all our students who are returning back to school. And it, I think it's just great that uh, we're going to be able to be there, welcome on them, and and do it in a great fashion. And I think also, and you, as an educator, it will also uh, invigorate a lot of our educators and get them um, uh, motivated. And uh, it's just something that I think that our students will truly uh, enjoy, and we will be able to move forward from that point on and, and implement uh, the first few days of school in a grand fashion. So just want to say thank you. Thank you, uh, Dan. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Board Member Barr. Any other comments or questions from board members? I'll add uh, just again, thanks for uh, recognizing the importance uh, and, and making it an important moment to bring those kids back to school. Uh, I have one of those kindergartners who is still uh, really yet to set foot on campus. She's actually been on the campus with her big brothers, but she's never been there as a student. So she's extremely excited. Uh, we are, and it's an opportunity to have that celebration that we didn't get to have last year uh, and recognizing the return for all of our students and how important it is to have them back on campus. But I, I wanna thank Board Member Adeguin for sharing an, an important point. I know we're going to get into this in the next portion of the presentation, which talks about what those early days will look like in supporting our students. But we are going to have parents. I'm a parent. We have parents on the board, grandparents, people that are going to want to know what what does a return to school look like for our kids? What safety measures are going to be in place? What are we going to be required to do with respect to masks, social distancing, things that we don't necessarily have all the answers to because it's still evolving. But um, how are we going to address those questions that are going to come up that even the kids have? I think I think board member Adegin's example is a wonderful one because even the kids, my kids, are asking those questions about is it safe? Are we going to be able to sit with our friends at lunch? All of those kinds of things are going to come up. So um, 
I'll, I'll, that'll lead into this next presentation. So unless there are other comments or questions, I can turn it back to Mr. Dade and, uh, and, and Antonio. Mr. Castro is gonna lead us into that next part of the presentation. Yes, thank you very much. And um, all of your comments are, are very much um, right on point. And we're prepared to share all of that information of how what it's gonna look like um, for our students to return. Um, the good thing is that we've, we've started to practice that with small cohorts in summer school. Um, so we're getting a small glimpse of that, but definitely uh, Mr. Antonio Castro will be able to take us into a deeper look at what we're going to be doing to make sure that those students who might be hesitant or even staff um, who are hesitant um, feel safe in, in returning. I will, prior to introducing uh, Mr. Castro, I would just want to say that, as we all know, social emotional learning, SEL, it's not a program. It's really about best practices. And we all do it every day in, in our in our different capacities. And it could be as simple as greeting someone by name and saying, good morning, you know, or how was your how was your evening or how was your weekend? Um, it could be posters that have positive, you know, messages on it. It could be activities during recess or lunch. Um, but you know, you'll see different type of examples of that. Um, throughout that first eight days of school. And then there'll be some other days um, and, you know, we're gonna, and I'll, I'm gonna steal Antonio's thunder, but there'll be a day each month where we'll bring it back to that, um, specifically district-wide um, to that SEL focus. Um, but once again, I wanna reiterate that our classified and certificated, they do SEL things every day for parents and students, but we just wanted to make sure that um, we took a deeper look into that. And with that, I will go ahead and, and allow for Mr. Castro to go ahead and finish off the presentation. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Dade, I appreciate it. Uh, good evening, board, uh, President Flores, board members, Superintendent Miranda, and all of those who are joining us online this evening. Uh, my name is Antonio Castro, and, and it's truly an honor and a pleasure to be here tonight to talk a little bit about our first eight days of school initiative that we are starting uh, on the very first day of school. Uh, I, I wanna give a special thank you, by the way, to, to our leader, our student services leader, Mr. Dade, for, for his vision and, and his initiative in implementing this, this amazing initiative for, for our students. And as I begin the presentation, I'm inspired to say that the grand reopening is really about culture. It's really about creating a culture and a spirit of caring, a spirit of SEL that we intend to carry throughout the entire school year. And that's what I'm gonna be presenting on tonight. Next uh, slide, please. There are, you know, I wanna give a little bit of context before I get into the first eight days of school. And so, you know, there, there, are, there are many uh, out there, and I heard this in, in different, uh, you know, presentation, uh, presentations and trainings that are referring to the new school year as the great catch up. We understand that many of our students have been affected, you know, in terms of their, in terms of their academics and their mindset uh, towards learning. And so it, it's gonna be a, a year of rigorous uh, teaching and learning and recovery for many students. However, uh, it will, there will also be just as great a need to support our students, both socially and emotionally. And it, it shouldn't be an either or approach. We're going to have to marry the two. We're going to have to marry, you know, the, the, uh, the push for rigorous learning and teaching and also the, impo uh, the importance of social and emotional well-being and taking that into consideration. You know, in fact, I'm so excited to share that the science behind learning and the brain is teaching us and it's showing us that the school environment that we create can absolutely help students to access learning and to thrive. But we have to focus on some, on some very important things. We have to focus on valuing students' identities, their sense of physical and emotional safety and well-being, and their, and their sense of connection to peers and adults. Next slide, please. So in essence, um, I think across the country, as students come back to our schools for in-person learning next school year, uh, th this really presents an opportunity. We have to, we have to seize the moment uh, for, for, for the opportunity that this is going to present to us. Again, where we create a culture of resilience and, and whereby we acknowledge not only what kids have been through, but where we nurture their strengths and we nurture their resiliency. Next slide, please. Now, in order to understand where we're going uh, with the first eight days of school, it is important that we first take a moment to pause and to reflect on where our students have been uh, in the last year, year and a half. 
Um, it's no surprise that the distance learning and the pandemic has not only created an adjustment dilemma for created an adjustment dilemma for many of our students that led to symptoms of stress, of anxiety, depression, and other mental health related issues, but it also unfortunately led to many students experiencing adverse uh, experiences and it exposed many others to trauma. So we have to recognize uh, that our students um, are going to be returning and some of them, are, and, and we don't know the exact quantity, but we, we understand and we have to acknowledge that there are gonna be those students that are gonna be dysregulated as they return to the new school year. Next slide, please. According to uh, Dr. Bruce Perry, who's actually a leading researcher on trauma, um, the, and I quote, the more healthy relationships that a child has, the more likely he or she will be to recover from trauma and thrive. Relationships are the agents of change and the most powerful therapy is human love. You know, there are, so, there are some out there that believe that most trauma that children experience is created in relationships. Therefore, trauma must be healed in relationships. And what a powerful message that is for us to galvanize as a school district and to really take the first eight days to intentionally acknowledge how important our students are, their social and, and emotional well-being. And we have to do that by focusing on three important areas. We have to focus on adult resiliency and well-being. We have to focus on student belonging relationships and their well-being. And we have to focus on universal and tiered supports and interventions across academics and the implementation of SEL practices, not programs, but practices. Next slide, please. So, <clears throat> excuse me, we understand, uh, again, as the students return to the new school year, that there's gonna be different levels of need. And I'm so proud to say uh, with a lot of uh, sacrifice that we have a comprehensive plan for supporting the student, our needs of our, our, of our students, the social and emotional needs of our students as they return to the, uh, to the new school year. Um, our mental health program is well equipped and ready, uh, all hands on deck to support those students who are going to be you know, uh, exhibiting uh, mental health issues. Uh, we are also very well connected to community sports and community uh, resources, uh, such as the crisis team, uh, the Department of Behavioral Health, South Coast, and, and others. So we have a plan, but the first eight days is really, uh, from an MTSS perspective, it's really a universal initiative or universal practice that we should all be engaging in. And it has everything to do with doing the small things like implementing relationship building rituals for, with kids. It has to do with fostering a safe environment at our schools. It has to do, for example, with fostering compassion and empathy and resilience. So these are really things that we've already been doing, but we just have to be more intentional in the new school year to make sure that we are creating that environment each and every single day for our students. Next slide, please. So we had a, a meeting with our administrators, uh, with our leaders, our school leaders, and our school counselors, whereby we suggested that they come together as a school site and develop teams or committees per se, uh, to come up with a plan for the first eight days. And you know, th this is just a suggestion that we, per that we gave to them uh, to consider their school counselors, be it EL or ERMS as well, administrators, wellness center coordinators, their PBIS team, uh, including student, student leadership, security, and really any motivated staff to come together and to plan for the first eight days. Next slide, please. So what we did uh, very recently is we provided all of our school uh, admin with a sample plan of what we, you know, what would we suggest for this first eight days of school to look like. Uh, as you can see here, there are different kinds of uh, suggestions or ideas from the, the very simple act of just welcoming our students back to school and, and, and you know, implementing a, a very positive, creating a positive environment, an uplifting environment for our students to come back in, uh, to implementing uh, just very simple activities that uh, encourage bonding and relationships and motivation for our students. Next slide, please. So ultimately, what we suggested to our school sites are to just implement practices. Again, this is not a program, but these are very simple activities uh, that we suggested for all of our schools to implement. And this was just a plan for them to follow to give them some ideas. We recognize that every single school has their own need, has their unique uh, populations and demographics. So we expect for every school 
to develop their uh, their you know first eight day plan based on their resources, based on their unique uh, circumstances and their unique student population. Next slide, please. And last but not least, um, again, the first eight days is just being intentional about SEL practices, things that we do every single day, like Mr. Date said. But we don't want to just stop there. We don't want to just uh, focus and, and, and honor this for the first eight days of school. We want this to become a practice. We want this to become part of our district's culture. And one of the simple ways that we are going to memorialize wellness throughout the school year is by providing a shirt. So I decided uh, to provide every single administrator uh, with a wellness uh, polo shirt. And the purpose of the shirt uh, and the significance of the shirt, actually, there's, there's, it's very meaningful, the colors and the graphics there, uh, the ribbon. This is a ribbon, and these are the colors that memorialize uh, Mental Health Awareness Month, which is usually in the month of May. But we understand that mental health is really something that we should be considering each and every day, each and every single week, each and every single month. So what we're going to do is provide these shirts to our school leaders, uh, and they are to wear these shirts. Uh, we're going to suggest that they wear these shirts the first Friday of every month, again, to memorialize wellness. And along with that, we are suggesting that they implement, that they carry some of those activities that they implemented for the first eight days and implement those activities on the first Friday of every month. Ultimately, uh, we want this, uh, again, to become part of our culture. We want wellness. We want SEL to become part of our culture, part of our, our of our collective practice at CJUSD. So we're very excited to support. And again, as I said earlier, it's all hands on deck. We are ready for the new school year. We can't wait to get our students back and to begin the process of healing for many of them. Next slide, please. And at this point, we'll pause and 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 ask if there's any questions or clarifications or, or comments that our board members have for Mr. Right. Castro. Thank you for that, Brandon. So questions from board members. I, I, I just want to say thank you. Um, thank you, Mr. Dade. Um, this is this is amazing. I, I, I really, really appreciate all the work and and Antonio, uh, Mr. Castro, I truly appreciate your expertise in this area. I have attended some of the parent workshops that you presented, and they're just full of great information for our, our community. So thank you for that. Um, I am very proud of this district. I am proud of the staff. I am proud of you know, the teachers and every custodian and bus driver or nutrition worker that is, takes part in this because every single person, every single um, member of our um, family in, in our district cares about kids. So, you know, if you're a teacher, you know, you, you said these are practices, these are suggestions. If you're a teacher and you see a teachable moment or, you, or you're in the middle of a, of a, of a reading lesson and you see a, a teachable moment or, or a, a need, you stop. You know, that's just what we do. It's in our nature. You stop what you're doing and you address it and you take advantage of that, that moment to, to um, you know, address the needs of the students. Even a, a custodian who is in the cafeteria, if they see a child hurting or a child needing something, that custodian is also going to do the same thing. So we're a family, and and um, and we need to embrace embrace that and celebrate that. We are. Um, it's it's Colton is a great place for our kids, and and today today you you've proven that, and uh, I am very excited to see this implemented. So thank you, thank you so much. Thank you, board member Adegin. Other questions or comments from board members? This is board member Haro. Um, I, I too wanted to thank uh, both Mr. Dade and Mr. Castro. Um, we know that this year has been trying on everyone, um, you know, all the adults, but we are better equipped to adjust and our kids are not. And so this is so important, uh, the things that we're going to be doing. And I'm very, uh, like board member Aragin said, I'm very proud of this district that we're looking at, at doing this and how important it is. And um, so I just want to say thank you to both of you. Thank you. Thank you, board member. Other comments or questions from board members? I have board one. president. Oh, go ahead. Uh, go ahead, Joanne. 
Um, again, thank you, um, Mr. Dade, for and um, Antonio, for this wonderful program. One of the things, um, Antonio, that was suggested, I think, in day two or day three, it said um, have the students keep a journal and write down two or three things that um, that were, it went well, or two or three things that they're going to remember about remember about the day. And I, as a principal, I think I would encourage teachers to do that as well, because I think that can really show growth and help them remember that each and every day is important emotionally for not only the kids, but for themselves as well. And I think when we look at culture of a school, um, that could, that could, I think, go a long ways and bring out some discussions among staff as well to, to continually work on that engaging in that kind of a culture and creating that kind of a culture for kids and staff as well to make it a place a safe place back years ago before mr perry you talked about uh brian Campbell and we had conditions of learning and, and the school environment being a safe place was one of the most important parts of learning for kids being ex uh, to be being able to access um what's being taught and so i just thought it'd be a neat idea if some principals might encourage teachers to and themselves to participate in that and share with kids and just talk about emotional things because um, not all teachers are there either. And I think it could be a real growth experience for everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Board Member Thorne Ojeda. Uh, board Member Fuentes. Thank you, uh, Board President. Just wanted to kind of ditto what, our co what the co my colleagues have said, <coughs> excuse me, and uh, just as I'm looking at the eight day simple sample plan, phenomenal. What a phenomenal plan. And uh, I'm very excited. Uh, I think this is gonna help our students. It's gonna help everyone, I would say overall, uh, especially our students, you know, their well being mentally as they come back to school. I think uh, their learning skills will probably go up higher. Uh, there's a lot of great things in this plan. And as I look at it, it's just awesome. And and uh, uh, Mr. Castro, Senor Castro, thank you very much uh, for all the hard work. Uh, please express that to your team also. Uh, Brandon, thank you. Uh, <clears throat> we are a family. Colton is a family. No matter what anybody says, we are here. Uh, we care for our kids. We love our kids. I did see I was out with uh, Bertha uh, at Cooley Ranch. And I did see the young lady that was struggling to come back up on campus. And all you needed was a little love, a little attention. And this young lady walked into campus. And that's what Bertha gave her. Mm -hmm. And I think all of us, this is what we're going to do is give them that love, give them that attention, give them that, listen to them as they walk into our campuses. And I can tell you right now, we're going to have a very successful, successful year already, victorious year. And thank you once again, Mr. Castro, Brandon. Uh, for all the hard work you've done. Thank you. Okay, thank you for that board member point this. Any other uh, comments or questions from board members? I, I just had a real quick question with respect to outreach or support for the school sites. Um, should a principal counselor or, or staff, teachers or staff at a school site encounter a question or a concern or something that come up? Is there is there going to be somebody, a point of contact for each school site or somebody that they can reach out to to get some advice on how to handle the situation, a concern a parent might have or a student may have, is there going to be uh, a point person for them? Yes, um, and Mr. Castro, if you could speak to just from your, your department and then I'll speak more globally. Absolutely, uh, yes, uh, Mr. Flores, absolutely. Um, you know, it, it's, part of the, it's part of the culture and the practice that we've established. Uh, the schools have been amazing at reaching out consulting when they need to, uh, administrators and counselors alike. So we have that culture established and I definitely serve as the go-to person for any of their questions or concerns that they have. So absolutely. Great, thank you. And Board President Flores, we, the Executive Cabinet is all also through Dr. Miranda's leadership, we've been divided up into quadrants to provide additional support um, just in case there's any, you know, just to make sure that there's a, a, a big span of our wing span of, of support. But to conclude our, our presentation, um, if we can go to the next slide. Um, this is a quote that, and I'll tell you a short story about it, but I'll read it first. I've learned that people will forget what you said. People will forget what you did 
but people will never forget how you made them feel, Maya Angelou. And so growing up um, as an inner city kid, my brothers and I um, would always be walked out to the porch before we got on the bus to go to school. And my grandmother, who's a former educator, would say, today, remember, your job is to go out, go to school and learn how you can make the world a better place. But remember, people are always going to remember how you made them feel. So it's not about just the books and, and developing or growing, you know, growing your intelligence. It's about growing your heart and, and how, you know, and your feelings and understanding people. So I, I believe that, you know, what Antonio and his team does really captures this, this particular quote, as well as what we're planning to do um, across the board for the first eight days of school and even prior and throughout the school year. And, and last, thank you so much to each of the board members for allowing us to, to do the work that we do. Without your support, we wouldn't be able to do it. And it starts with you and it starts with Dr. Miranda's leadership. And I truly believe that um, as we you know, navigate through this uncertainty of this new school year and, and the new normal, um, we will definitely not miss out on making our students, parents, staff, um, and community members feel that, that CJUSD family love. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for that, Mr. Dade. Uh, and thank you, Mr. Castro. Um, the, we are incredibly excited uh, to be able to bring students and staff, teachers uh, back to our campus. Um, but I love the fact that we're going to make sure that we do so with uh, a tremendous amount of in, in intentionality, if you will, about being mindful of how people feel. Um, it's been a very challenging year and we want to bring back folks in a supportive environment and that includes our staff. So I want to thank you for doing that. And Antonio, I want to thank you since you don't get to join us on all of our meetings. The work that you do behind the scenes with your team is pretty, um, pretty fantastic. And because we all know that social emotional support and the social services that we provide um, is is so important to the growth and development of our students, particularly in districts uh, that do have communities that are impacted in a number of ways. So your team, uh, whether it's the 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 interns that we have that come in and provide that support, or the staff that we have on uh, on our district um, as part of our district, are so key to the success of our students and our families. So we really appreciate that. So I just wanted to take a moment to, to recognize you and thank you since we have you here today. But thank you. Um, with that, we'll, we'll conclude this presentation and I'm sure we'll have more conversations about uh, the school year as we get ready to roll out an exciting um, new year because August will be around, around the corner before you know it. So thank you for that. <laughs> All right, well, now we go uh, to our action session items. That was item 5.2, our, our grand reopening um, presentation, and we've concluded. So item 6.0, our action session items. Tonight we have items 6.1 through 6.71. We do have a couple of items that we need to defer for separate consideration because they require readouts. So I will be deferring items 6.2 and 6.3 for a separate vote and readout. Uh, I also personally will be requesting that we pull 6.4, uh, which is the resume in person board meeting item. So I'll be pulling that. And I would like to ask if there are any other items that board members would like to pull for separate consideration. Yes, I would like to pull 6.39 and 6.67. 6.39 6 and 6.67. 6.7. Okay, great. Any other items? I'm hearing none. So what I will at this what I will ask for at this time is a motion to approve our action session items, uh, which would be 6.1 through 6.71, with the exception of the pulled items, which are 6.2, 6.3, 6.4, 6.39, and 6.67. So those will be excluded from this motion. So do we have a motion to approve the balance of the action session agenda? So move, Frank. Okay. Second, Israel. Great. A motion by board member Barr, second by board member Fuentes. Uh, Ms. Medina, roll call vote, please. Mr. Ibarra? Yes. Mrs. Haro? Mrs. Haro? Yes. Mr. Flores? Yes. Ms. Doreen Ojeda? Yes. Ms. Sandoval? Yes. Mr. Fuentes? Yes. 
Ms. Arigi. Yes. Thank you. All right. Thank you for that. Those items are approved. We'll go ahead and go to the items that have been pulled for separate consideration, and we'll just take these in numerical order. So we'll start with item 6.2. Uh, item 6.2 is the, sorry, let me pull my count back up here. Approval of third amendment to employment agreement between the assistant superintendent of ed services and the Colton Joint Unified School District. Again, this is being pulled for separate consideration uh, so that the readout can be given following action. So do we have a motion to approve this item? So moved, Israel Fuentes. All right, thank you. Do we have second a second? Second, Thorin Ojeda. Great, thank you. A motion uh, and a second by board member Thorin Ojeda. All right, Ms. Medina, a roll call vote, if you will. Mr. Flores, we're going to read out the terms of the contract. Oh, I apologize, I reread out in advance. You're correct. Um, and let me ask you just again any questions or uh, from board members? Okay, hearing and let me read out the terms, my apologies. Let me read out the terms prior to the uh, action taken. Um, this again is for uh, Dr. Peterson, the Assistant Superintendent of Ed Services, the agreement with the school district. The term is July 1st of 2018 through June 30th of 2021. Annual salary is 179,584. Annual work year is 223 days. Uh, district provided vehicle for the Assistant Superintendent's use. Benefits include health insurance, which are the same medical and dental insurance benefits offered to other certificated management employees, sick leave of 14 days per fiscal year, and retiree health, health benefits due to the length of the assistant superintendent's service with the district. The assistant superintendent is vested in the district's retiree health benefits program. And those are the details uh, of the contract. There are no questions from board members. I'll go ahead and now ask Ms. Medina for a roll call vote. Ms. Arigui? Yes. Mr. Fuentes? Yes. Ms. Sandoval? Yes. Ms. Torino Ojeda? Yes. Mr. Flores? Yes. Ms. Haro? Yes. Mr. Ibarra? Yes. Thank you. Great. Thank you for that. That item is approved. That takes to item 6.3. Item 6.3 is approval of the first amendment to employment agreement between the interim assistant superintendent of student services and the Colton Joint Unified School District. And again, this is an amendment to uh, an agreement for the interim um, assistant superintendent during the period in which uh, she was acting in that role. Uh, at this time, we will begin with, uh, well, let me go ahead and, uh, Ms. Mina, would it be appropriate to read out the terms of that uh, on the front end, and then we can ask for a motion and second? That would be fine. Okay, we'll go ahead and do that on, on the front end here since we have this. And again, this is for uh, Ms. Kingston, who was, served as our interim assistant superintendent of student services. So the term of that agreement was September 17, 2020, uh, and, and continue until the assistant superintendent position is filled, which will happen on January 31st of 2021. Again, this is the interim period. The annual salary is 179,584, annual work year 223 days, uh, district provided vehicle for the assistant superintendent's youth use. Uh, benefits include health insurance, which are the same medical and dental insurance benefits offered to other certificated management employees. Uh, sick leave shall earn the same sick leave provided in her director position. And retiree health benefits shall be the same as provided uh, to Ms. Kingston in her director position. Those are the terms of that uh, agreement as presented by staff. At this time, I'll ask if there is a motion to approve the item. So I'll moved, Israel Fuentes. I'll second. All right, great. Thank you. We have a motion by board member Fuentes, a second by board member Adeguin. Any questions from board members? All right, hearing none, I will ask Ms. Medina for a roll call vote. Ms. Adeguin? Yes. Mr. Fuentes? Yes. Ms. Sandoval? Yes. Thank you. Ms. Doreen Ojeda? Yes. Mr. Flores? Yes. Ms. Haro? Yes. Mr. Ibarra? Yes. Thank you. Thank you for that. That item is approved. Our next item for separate consideration is item 6.4, uh, to resume in-person board meetings. I went ahead and pulled the item, so I'll go ahead and make the motion to approve and ask if there's a second. 
Second that, second. Israel. <laughs> second by Board Member Fuentes. Um, and uh, the only reason I pulled the item again is is I wanted to, Dr. Miranda, if I may, uh, the recommendation is to return to in-person meetings um, at our, I believe our July 15th meeting is the targeted meeting. Uh, there probably are a number of things that we'll need to do to prepare for the in-person meetings, um, logistically in terms of the room, the layout. Uh, I, was, I thought it might be a good idea, if perhaps you and I, um, and uh, I would like to invite uh, Ms. Adegin as the vice president, since we facilitate the meetings and she would in my absence, if I were absent, um, maybe a good idea that we get together to look at the logistics of the room, the layout. Um, yeah. Even though we are reopening, if you will, the state, I think there's probably some due consideration for trying to distance folks if we can uh, a little bit and making sure that people have um, the space that they feel comfortable with and how we're going to handle logistically the seating. I mean, there's just a number of things uh, and it just helps as the person that runs the meeting, it just helps to be involved in that process. So I would ask if Dr. Miranda, if it would be okay and appropriate with uh, to work with you and staff, uh, Ms. Sadegin, and I, Ms. Sadegin, if you're amenable to, to joining us in a meeting or a conversation or even probably a site visit of the of the space, uh, well, we can do that prior to uh, our first in-person meeting. Would that be okay, Dr. Miranda? Absolutely, Board President. Uh, be more than happy to facilitate <clears throat> that meeting so we can just discuss the logistics and uh, talk about uh, setup and any adjustments uh, for not only the uh, general seating room, but also the closed session and uh, engage in a conversation about uh, just uh, that and, and um, uh, the mandates and the guidance that we need to talk about and get the community uh, and inform the community about. So uh, looking forward to that conversation, certainly. Uh, we can set that up uh, uh, next couple of weeks for sure. Great, thank you for that. And, and as, you, as you pointed out, a lot of changes are gonna happen quickly. We wanna make sure the public's informed of uh, the process and that'll impact not only the way we run the meetings but how public comment uh, participation takes place etc so uh, i think a lot of things will change uh, very quickly here so i appreciate that uh, that's that's all that i had with respect to that item unless somebody else had questions or comments on on 6.4 all right hearing none we have a motion and a second miss medina roll call vote please dan dan i hate to oh, sure yeah one, please one quick question i couldn't get my microphone on uh, will this? Uh, will we continue doing this virtually? Also, I know we talked about this, but will there be arrangements to continue our board meetings uh, virtually? Also, so um, go ahead, Mr. Flores. Uh, and I'll, again, I'll just share because we've had some of these conversations. The a lot of that will depend on the governor's um, the governor's executive order comes to well expires, if you will, here, which allows for a lot of uh, leeway within the Brown Act. A lot of that goes away. And unless it's replaced with something else, we kind of go back to the original Brown Act, which doesn't really allow for a lot of this virtual interaction. Um, the original Brown Act does allow for folks to call in, but it requires things such as uh, a public notice of where you're calling in from, the address of where you're calling in from, allowing public comment to take place where you're calling in from, things that don't make a lot of sense um, for folks who may be doing that from home, for example. So. Uh, again, I'll allow Dr. Miranda to elaborate, but generally speaking, I think it's going to depend upon what the governor and the state's going to allow us to do uh, if there's going to be some element of virtual participation by board members or the public. But, uh, Dr. Miranda or Ms. Medina, please. Uh, no, absolutely. I think you're you're absolutely right, uh, President Flores. Uh, uh, the uh, executive order that was passed uh, last year to give that flexibility uh, uh, the governor is still in discussions with that. Uh, the latest we've heard is that uh, even on June 15th, uh, the that executive order will not terminate. So there will be some uh, some flexibility when the blueprint goes away. Uh, so we are uh, meeting with our our legal and our attorney regarding that, and in, in order to provide more guidance, uh, so we can provide direction to uh, the community and to the uh, the board. So, but as right now, uh, latest we received was uh, that executive order, uh, which is 2920, uh, does not terminate on June 15th. We just don't know when it will. So we're still waiting for that to uh, to get that uh, uh, guidance on that. Thank you. I just wanted to make sure our, our public knew about that too, and uh, they were aware of that. 
uh, even though we're going into uh, in person uh, board meetings, uh, there's still, you know, you know, just the information so they would be informed of what's going on. Thank you. Appreciate that. No, thank you for that, uh, Board Member Fuentes. I think we're all eager to see what uh, what this will look like as the state makes adjustments to its uh, executive orders. Any other questions from, from board members? All right, hearing none, we do have a motion and a second for this item. So, Ms. Medina, a roll call vote, please. Ms. Adegui? Yes. yes. Mr. Fuentes? Yes. Ms. Sandoval? Yes. Ms. Torino Ojeda? Yes. Mr. Flores? Yes. Ms. Haro? Yes. Mr. Ibarra? Yes. Thank you. Thank you for that. The uh, item is approved. Uh, next item uh, that was deferred for separate consideration is item 6.39. 6.39 is the approval of language uh, essentials for reading and spelling license and staff development. And it was deferred by Ms. Adeguin. Uh, I will ask if there, first ask if there is a motion to approve the item. I'll make a motion to remove Thorin Ojeda. Oh, we've got a motion by Board Member Adeguin, second by Board Member Thorin Ojeda. Right. Questions or comments from board members? Ms. Adegui. Yes, um, I know that uh, we've had um, TOAs at the school sites, I, I believe in every school site, I, I may be wrong, but uh, we have uh, true experts in this um, in these strategies and they have been implementing them for uh, kindergarten and first grade, successfully implementing them. And, uh, you know, with literacy being our priority and you know, wanting our kids to read by the end of third grade. Uh, I'm very happy to see that we are expanding it into second grade. I'm also happy to see that that the, our TOAs will be training other uh, classroom teachers on this. So, so I'm very, I just want to say I, I, I strongly support this program and I'm very happy to see it being implemented and expanded. So that, that, that's all I wanted to say. And thank you to Dr. Hyder and Dr. Peterson for, for bringing this. Thank you for that, Board Member Adegine. Any other uh, questions or comments from board members? Mr. Flores, I have one. Yes, I just please. want to say that I, I agree with uh, Mrs. Adegine. I've heard wonderful things about this program. I'm glad to see that we're expanding it. It's great news, good for kids. Excellent, thank you, yes. Any other comments or questions? Right. Hearing none, we do have a, a motion and a second for the item. So I will ask Ms. Medina for a roll call vote. Ms. Adegine? Yes. Mr. Fuentes? Yes. Ms. Sandoval? Yes. Ms. Dorino Ojeda? Yes. Mr. Flores? Yes. Ms. Hara? Yes. Mr. Ibarra? Yes. Thank you. Thank you for that. The item is approved. Our uh, next item that was deferred for separate consideration is item 6.67. This is approval of agreement with the city of Colton for the provision of two school resource officers for the 2021-22 school year. Uh, this time I will ask if there is a motion to approve the item. I'll make a motion. I'll second that, Israel. Got a motion by board member Adegin, second by board member Fuentes. I believe Ms. Adegui need for this item as well, so uh, please. Okay, and, and, and again, I'm uh, very pleased to see this. Um, an SRO brings an uh, additional level of security. Uh, they, they provide prevention, interventions, deterrence of, um, of criminal activity, all, all that is good. But for, for me, the most, po the most powerful uh, aspect of having this SRO in our schools is the relationships that they they uh, bond with our students, the relations that the relationships that they form with our staff and our students as part of the community. So I'm I'm, I'm very excited to see this. Um, you know, and again, that to me it's super important that uh, uh, relationships, the relationships that that our SROs have with our staff and students. So that that's all I wanted to say. Thank you for that, uh, board member Adegin. Um I, I couldn't agree more. The relationship that we have as a district with our SROs 
um, is incredibly important, as you point out, for uh, not only a safety standpoint, but they participate in a lot of the planning, strategic planning for the district at a district-wide level, whether it comes to, again, safety measures, active shooter training, uh, they work hand in hand with our security staff and a lot of training. They take the lead on a lot of those things. So it's really important. But also, as you said, in, in ensuring that there is a positive and healthy relationship between um, our students and law enforcement, that they see someone that they can look up to who is in a uniform that is there and they know to protect them, to look out for them, um, to connect with them. And whether it's the elementary kids who love to get the stickers and, and sit in the back of the car, or the high school kids um, uh, that um, will go to the SROs to share something confidential because they heard something or saw something. That only comes through relationship building and having really a good relationships with good SROs who are there for the kids. I wanna thank staff, uh, Mr. Dade and, and in particular and your team. This is the first time that I think we've contracted for two SROs for Colton, Colton School District for uh, the Colton community City of Colton. We've had two because of grants and other funding that the city put up. Um, this time we are making uh, making a, a conscious agreement to have two SROs for Colton. We have more school sites in the city of Colton uh, and most of our district offices are in the city of Colton. And so when you look at the district and we have an SRO for Grand Terrace that covers that jurisdiction. Um, we have an SRO through the County Sheriff's Department for Bloomington that covers that jurisdiction. But to be fair, you know, we really have a lot more going on in Colton in terms of facilities uh, and uh, staffing, um, district facilities. So it only makes sense to make sure that we can cover all of those facilities. So the, the two SROs, particularly when you have the, uh, the focusing on the high school and then the elementary during a, a reopening of the school sites is gonna be really important. So I appreciate you um, bringing the contract before uh, the board for consideration. Um, other other comments or questions from board members? Just a quick comment, uh, board member. Uh, board, excuse me, uh, for, uh, board president. Uh, yeah, board, please. Uh, just, just I'm excited. I'm excited that we're able to bring two uh, two uh, SROs out to the Colton area. Uh, you know, as a former law enforcement, it's always needed to to have. And you know, we're pro uh, law enforcement. We want to make sure that we do have that protection for our kids. That that mental safety of just seeing that gentleman in uh, uniform or women in uniform. And so I'm very, very excited and I approve this, you know, with a big, big yes. So I'm loving it. So uh, thank you again to uh, the team, Brandon Data and his team for, for doing all the work. And Rick, I know he had part in this, uh, making sure that we were able to budget and bring these SROs to Colton area. Thank you very much. Thank you for that. Um, any other comments or questions from staff? Hearing none, uh, we do have a motion and a second. Uh, I'll ask Ms. Medina for a roll call vote. Mr. Ibarra? Yes. Mr. Ibarra? Yes. Mrs. Haro? Yes. Mr. Flores? Yes. Ms. Doreen Ojeda? Yes. Ms. Sandoval? Yes. Mr. Fuentes? A big yes. Ms. Adegin? Yes. Thank you. Thank you for that, Ms. Medina. That item is approved. Uh, that was our last item that was pulled for separate consideration. So that concludes our all of our action session items for this evening. Thank the board for that. That then takes us to uh, the next item on our agenda. Uh, we have two CFDs on the agenda for this evening. Uh, given that these are separated entities, if you will, we're going to go ahead and uh, adjourn from the regular Board of Education meeting, if you will, and then we will open uh, for each of these CFDs. So you'll see us adjourn, open, adjourn, open. It's a technical process that we'll need to do for these community facilities districts that are in the, uh, I believe both are in the South Montana area. So that's just a preview. So what we'll do is we will go ahead and officially uh, adjourn from the regular board meeting for the Board of Education for the Colton Junior High School District. And uh, I will gavel us in, if you will, uh, for uh, the meeting of the legislative body for community, community facilities district number two, uh, of which item 7.1 is the adoption of a resolution, uh, resolution number 2159, establishing the annual special levy, uh, special tax levy for fiscal year 2122 for CFD district number two. So, uh, acting as that legislative body at this time, um, I will uh, ask if there is a motion to approve the item as presented by staff.
So move. Okay, thank you, Ms. Thorne Ojeda. Is there a second? And the vote second. Okay, board member out again. We have a motion and a second. Um, Ms. Medina, I presume we don't have any public comments for this particular item? We do not. We do not, okay. All right, so we have a motion and a second to approve the resolution as presented by staff. I'll now ask for a roll call vote. Mr. Ibarra? Yes. Mrs. Haro? Mrs. Hart? Yeah. Yes. Mr. Flores? Yes. Ms. Torino Heda? Yes. Ms. Sandoval? Yes. Mr. Fuentes? Yes. Ms. Arigin? Yes. Thank you. Thank you for that, uh, Ms. Medina. That item is approved unanimously. It takes us to item 8.0. This is our community facility district number three. And so I'll be closing. Uh, a meeting, if you will, for as a legislative body for CFD number two and opening the meeting as a legislative body for community, community facilities district number three for the Colton Joint Unified School District. Item 8.1 is the adoption of resolution 2160 CFD three. This is establishing the annual special tax levy for fiscal year 21 22 for community facilities district number three. Meeting is now open, and I will ask if there is a motion from the board to approve the resolution as presented by staff. So moved, Israel Fuentes. A motion by board member Fuentes. Second, Thorin Ojeda. Second by board member Thorin Ojeda. Um, Ms. Medina, are there any public comments on this item? There are no public comments on this item. Great, thank you for that. All right, any questions or comments from board members? All right, hearing none, we do have a motion and a second. For approval of the resolution, I'll ask Ms. Medina for a roll call vote. Ms. Arigin? Yes. Mr. Fuentes? Yes. Ms. Sandoval? Yes. Ms. Torino Ojeda? Yes. Mr. Flores? Yes. Ms. Haro? Yes. Mr. Ibarra? Yes. Thank you. Thank you for that. But I didn't, the resolution is approved unanimously. I will now close the meeting for legislative body for CFD number three and reconvene the regular meeting for the Columbia Unified School District Board of Education. That takes us to next items on the agenda, our administrative reports. Um, are there any questions uh, with respect to item 9.1, our approved disbursements? All right, hearing none, takes us to our facilities update. I do believe we have an update today from Director Chang. Mr. Chang, the floor is yours. We have him online. He is online. Mr. Chang, can you hear us? I see that you're unmuted. If you want to go and rejoin, I'll, I'll keep an eye open for you if you want me to make you a panelist again. Hmm. Uh, oh, and I don't see your camera on either. Maybe you're, are you having Wi-Fi issues? You can text me. Okay, so I think he just left, so maybe he'll rejoin uh, Melanie. Sounds good, thank you. No problem. Hi, Owen, you should uh, be a panelist again. Do you wanna give it another go? Hi, can you hear me? Wonderful, yes. Oh, yeah, 
apologize. Excellent. No worries, Owen. The floor, the floor is yours. We have your slides up, so please go ahead and proceed. I appreciate it. Good evening, Board President Flores, Superintendent Miranda, a Board Members of the Public. I yeah, apologize for technical difficulties. Uh, again, thank you for the opportunity to present the project update uh, this evening. Uh, next slide, please. All right, first up is the uh, Colton High School uh, NPR building. The pro these are some of the uh, recent uh, progress photos. Um, although we've uh, made some good progress, not without some little bump in the road, um, some of the things uh, affect the COVID we're still um, actually seeing um, it's affecting uh, some of the particular labor uh, sources. Some of the couple months ago, because of slowdown, some of the company and trades had let go some of the staff. Right now, as construction starts to pick up, uh, they're having a difficult time getting the same staff back because they have other jobs and projects. So uh, one particular trade we're experiencing some challenges is the uh, the drywall uh, tray. So uh, we're uh, having some, uh, they're having some difficulty uh, getting uh, accurately staff uh, for that particular trade. Um, even the union halls, they, they weren't able to provide the, the laborers needed for uh, that particular trade. But we have where we're still continuing to do what we can to push project forward. Um, and uh, so we are making still some uh, some decent progress. On the left hand side are the uh, the main dining hall, which uh, we did finish some drywall and 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 mud and, and taping. So they're actually getting ready to paint. Uh, bottom left is the staff lounge area and that area has been uh, painted as well um and on the right hand side just uh showing uh, the kitchen area and uh in the foreground are the kitchen hood that are uh, getting ready to be uh, installed uh, next slide please uh, these are some of the we're making some good progress on the uh on, on the exterior of the building uh, so on the left hand side are the north elevation uh, looking towards Valley uh, Stack Bar area, as well as the north entry into the building. Uh, on the upper right-hand side is the freestanding uh, toilet building directly adjacent to the MPR building. And bottom right is the east, east elevation. You can see uh, some uh, some final painting it is currently being um, uh, worked on, as well as some of the uh, exterior wall cladding. Next slide, please. I uh, also like to provide board a couple of updates on board priority projects. Uh, first one is Bloomington High School parking expansion project. Uh, that project is currently bidding. We had a job block last week. We had pretty good turnout, and we have seven contractors that participated in the job block. Uh, we're tentatively scheduled for bid opening on June 22nd, and also construction we're projecting to take place from mid July through middle of November. Uh, next one is the uh, Bloomington High School Auditorium uh, uh, rigging lighting audiovisual system upgrade. We are working with the architect and the uh, staff on finalizing some of the technical bid document, and we should be uh, ready for uh, to bid out that project. Um, hopefully, uh, sometime next, as early as next week. Uh, last one on this slide is the Colton uh, Middle School HVAC. Replacement. Uh, this is something that we've been collaborating with uh, maintenance and operation on. So utilizing the uh, CARES Act funding to replace uh, 23 uh, air conditioning units at Colton uh, Middle School. So we've started the first phase of replacement, uh, which is six units, and, and that should um, be completed hopefully uh, next week. Then we'll uh, continue to work on the rest of the, the uh, units for the the campus. Next slide, please. All right, uh, just two more uh, quick updates on the uh, other. Both these are also board prior projects. One is the Crestmore Elementary parking upgrade. We had uh, a kickoff meeting with the site administrator and the architect uh, on June 3rd. And then uh, followed that, we had the uh, Fulton High School CTE uh, culinary arts building uh, project. We had a kickoff meeting on the 7th as well with the site staff. 
uh, Dr. Mooney and staff, as well as district uh, support staff. Uh, we had discussed some uh, concept and goals and visions, and, and we were excited to get this project kicked off to really uh, some really great visions and ideas to provide a state of the uh, art facility for our students and staff. Next slide, please. All right, the, the last uh, update or the next series of, of slides or the uh, or is the Staff Development Center boardroom at the 900 uh, Washington building. So the goal tonight is uh, for the staff to present the design to the board and receive any feedback and comments. If there's nothing significant or revisions needed, the staff would like to request consensus from the board to move forward with complete the design as well as the, the technical documents. So the first slide right here, you see the horseshoe shape is the floor plan of the first floor building. The one that's shaded in gray on the right side and portion of the north uh, northwest corner are currently occupied by private tenant. The area that's outlined in blue are, is the space that's available for the staff development center and the boardroom. So just give a sense of uh, the, the area that we have to to work within. Uh, next slide, please. So this uh, just a quick diagram, just to give a kind of points of, a, a sense of size and a scale. Um, the uh, red line that's uh, the red rectangular shape is approximate area of the existing boardroom. So hopefully this will give the board an approximate idea of this uh, proposed. Uh, staff development center as well the boardroom relative to the new space that we're are, uh, designing. Next slide, please. All right, this is a uh, little color coded uh, highlighting some of the major components of programs uh, spaces uh, within the uh, staff development center. Starting from the upper left hand side, we have the board closed uh, session room uh, going clockwise. Uh, this uh, is the uh, district uh, server room. So in addition to the staff wellness center and the um, the boardroom, uh, our intent is to include in the first phase is to relocate the district main server to the 900 building to eventually serve the consolidated district office. Um, and adjacent to that, we have the uh, storage room um, to serve the uh, boardroom and the training room. Uh, we also have a uh, new toilet rooms that are needed to meet the code requirements. Continuing clockwise, we have the, the green area, the highlight is the main uh, training in the boardroom. And just to the north of that is, uh, is a secondary training room that is um, that actually opens out into the boardroom for additional overflow, whether during training or boardroom, there's actually a removal partition to provide a separation, a smaller training area if needed. Next slide, please. All right, this is a little bit more enlarged plan with a little bit more detail showing some of the amenities provided in each of the space. Uh, the one in kind of light blue uh, on the north side, north uh, end of the floor plan is the uh, separate breakout rooms I mentioned earlier. Uh, there are uh, LED projection or technology uh, that's provided in the front and also at the Opposite side of the room is that retractable partition that I mentioned that allow uh, a separate a breakout space for training or other type of presentation. At the bottom green area, um, we have the main training room that's about 3,300 square feet. And that would, based on the layout provided, we can um, accommodate about 160 uh, seats. Um, Right below that, I show this two little red dot that you see. Those are actually existing uh, steel columns. Um, you know, the, the, unfortunately, that's the existing um, you know structure. We can't really do anything about. Um, and uh, but um, you know, we'll, but it, we looked at various layout, and this is really the um, the option that's available. That's at least uh, visually intrusive um, for the uh, for the staff training space. Uh, below that, we have the, uh, the uh, public speaking podium. Uh, flanking on either side are the seating for executive cabinet. 
Um, below that, we have the, the dais as well, flanked by uh, various equipment and storage room. Uh, the dais is uh, also elevated by about six inches, and there's a ramp behind that to serve the, uh, to gain access uh, to the dais. Uh, we're also providing a separate uh, entrance uh, uh, to, so there's ease of access for staff uh, as well as the board. Next slide, please. So previous slide shows the, in, in terms of the, the training space shows uh, the, what the seating arrangement would look like and for the uh, boardroom setting or even training. Um, but there are really, uh, just because of the openness of the space, there are really numerous uh, possibility and available availability for flexibility of training. And these are just three areas uh, or three options uh, that are available for a uh, separate uh, breakout area. It's just the fact with the uh, utilization of the different furniture, uh, you can see that it, it creates quite a, a, a various um, options that are available for um, these breakout uh, sessions um, in, in, in smaller group meetings and, and, and collaboration area. Uh, at the bottom center is the uh, very similar to the the boardroom layout, except the presentation is, is flipped, or the, the seating arrangement is flipped where you have the front of the room oriented to the north end of the building. But again, you know, there are numerous, obviously uh, quite a few um, you know, other uh, options, and these are just a couple of examples that are just to show the uh, flexibility of the space. Uh, next slide, please. So this is a more interesting picture to look at. So this is some of the renderings that we have provided. This is uh, on the upper left hand side. I have little key plans, point of reference. This is the uh, a 3D perspective looking from the back of the room uh, towards the dais. You can see uh, on either side for um, uh, of the dais, there are uh, large LED displays uh, to help with the uh, uh, the sight line and, and also reviewing the information that's being presented. Next slide, please. And this is the uh, another perspective of looking at the board dice, uh, looking towards the audience. You can see uh, the seating arrangements a little different. We want to show some, again, some variety, another way of possibility to uh, arrange the room for uh, other type of training besides the board room. Next slide, please. And uh, this is a, again another rendering looking uh, diagonally across the room from the from the back of the room uh, across to the the front of the area. You can see there are various displays throughout the room, uh, technology, and uh, to support the uh, various training that are available. And next slide, please. All right. Also, just a quick preliminary project schedule, uh, assuming with the board consensus to move forward, we would complete the design technical document in about three to four months. Uh, that will follow by an agency review and approval. Um, we are required to submit to both City of Colton and Division of State Architect for accessibility review. And uh, we're projecting that to take about, anticipating that about two months, hopefully. And follow that will be the bidding board of war. So take another two months, and then uh, after the award, then the construction, we're estimating about a six-month duration. So all in all, we're looking about a 14-month uh, duration from uh, the time that the design has been approved. So uh, this concludes uh, my uh, presentation. I would like to ask if board had any questions or comments. Thank you for that, Mr. Mr. Chang. Um, yeah, we'll start with questions or, or comments from board members um, on, uh, well, you've covered a number of things. Obviously, we have other um, projects that are in the works, and then I know you're looking for consensus with respect to the staff development center. So I'll open it up to see if folks have questions on either one. Um, I have a question, board member. Yeah, please. Okay. Uh, first of all, um, I'm just curious as far as the size of this room, um, it, as far as how much bigger is it in comparison to our current board board meeting room? 
Um, it, it's not is uh, it's not too much larger. Uh, just in terms of the open area, the um, it, it's probably about um, I would say less than two hundred square feet larger uh, than the current boardroom. Uh, one thing that the this particular boardroom uh, there's some limitation that we have. I mentioned you know is structural columns. Um, the existing boardroom there's what's called like grand. There's no structure. Uh, in this particular this existing building, there are two columns that are within the space. But um, I think you know, with the way it's laid out, it's it's minimally intrusive. Um, and also, in terms, the other thing is this: the ceiling height. Um, the board existing boardroom is about 13 feet uh, high ceiling. And this particular building, uh, you know, again, it's an existing condition. We have to work with. We're looking at probably about a nine foot six high ceiling instead of a, a 13 ceiling. So the ceiling will be a little bit lower. Okay. And then um, I'm, maybe I missed it, but where is the closed session room in that drawing? Oh, yeah. If I may, um, okay. can you go back to slide number uh, eight? So closed session room is to the upper left hand side in, in the yellow color. So okay. Closed session room, there's a little um, a counter as well as a, a dedicated restroom facility. Okay, so the but it's all part of the their um, it's all ADA accessible and everything. Yes, definitely. Okay, and um, my last question is. Yeah, after all the questions are done and if we decide to do this or we don't decide to do this right now, um, where is the money coming from for this project? It's not, I know it doesn't come from funds that we would use for students. I know that, but I'd like to know um, where are we looking for this money to come from? Well, um, we, we have been saving a, a you know, money, some, some of the uh, money that we um, are generating, uh, we are uh, having a positive cash flow uh, for this this um, project. Uh, so we've been uh, saving, uh, putting that aside to pay for, for this, uh, this project. And also we have funding set aside. If recall, we had the, uh, originally we had um, the professional learning center that was supposed to take place at 12-12. So some of the funding uh, for this project has been redirected for this project. And also, in addition, we also are, are, are contributing uh, because the Staff Development Center were uh, allocating some of the bond funds to pay for uh, this project as well. So we're using, I'm sorry, what was the last part? Oh, the, the uh, Measure G bond funds. I thought that couldn't be used for, for things like that. I thought it could only be used for schools. No, for, for administrative support, uh, staff development center, uh, we did check with our attorney and, and, and that is permitted. Uh, that is a, a allowed use of uh, the, the bond funds for the staff training center. Okay, thank you. Thank you, board member. Are other questions, comments from board members? Yeah, I, I have, have a question. Oh, I'm sorry. Well, uh, board member Thorne, I hit it. Hi. <clears throat> Thank you. Oh, and you said that <clears throat> the closed session room yeah, and on the diagram, it, the main server room is right next door. How much noise is, um, comes from that room? Is that going to cause any uh, issue? Or are there, how, how loud is that server room going to get? Oh, the, the, the server room, it, it does, um, you know, generate some sound, but we can um, you know, mitigate that by, uh, there's, a, you know, in, in terms of the construction of the wall, there are different measure. You can put multiple layers of jip or sometimes you can do a double layer of, 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 of wall um, for to provide, um, you know, adequate uh, sound separation from adjacent spaces. But uh, that's definitely, we'll, uh, we'll definitely make sure that there's a, yeah, adequate separation provided so it doesn't become uh, a nuisance to adjacent spaces. And not only a nuisance, but um, make, making it very difficult to hear when really important things are being discussed and 
uh, make sure we are all on the same page for getting the same information. Thank you. Um, one other question. You said the dais had a six inch, um, uh, it was six, six, six inches up and there was a ramp from the, from the chair area to the wall behind, how much space is there? Uh, you said it was eight yeah. Yes, if you can see, um, there's, it's really faint on either side. There's a little kind of circle, um, and that's actually a, a five-foot turning circle to meet the ADA compliance. So that gives a little bit of reference. So there's enough space for, yeah, if you pan, pan down. Actually, you, talking about from the dais, not from the Yeah, room. the dais, if you pan down a little bit more, Millie. There we go. So you can see there's a rectangle area that's for adequate ADA seating. And then on the right hand side, there's a little circle. Uh, it's a five foot turning circle. To make sure there's adequate okay. clearance for, for a wheelchair uh, maneuvering right. space. Thank you. Sure. Thank you. Um, other, other questions, comments from board members? Yeah, I had a, I had a question. Owen, yeah. everything you showed us, in this slide, this is all on the first floor? Yes, this is all on the first floor, yes. Okay, and is it a two-story building? Oh, uh, this one is a three-story building. Three-story building. Thank you for bringing that to that. The 900 is a, a three-building, it's a, a three-story building. It's a larger of the two buildings uh, that we have. Okay, and we've discussed or we've talked about having a parent center. Where would this parent center be located? Yes, we are um, actually um, working with uh, LPA architects uh, on the master planning of this whole building in terms of how the space is going to be allocated and designed and so forth. So we are uh, currently doing uh, working with them on the layout and, and the spatialization for the second and third floor. Now, uh, part of the challenge is, is, um, is, is the tenants uh, that we have existing leases. They have some options uh that were um and, and also lease expiration at different dates so we have to and, and they hold the right to to exercise their option or not so uh the the availability of space depends depending on you know whether they're going to exercise and how we're going to plan out the space um so uh, we are continuing to work on that so we're, but we are attentively looking at the uh parent resource center being located on the second floor of the 900 building of this building Thank you, Owen. You're welcome. So, Owen, just real yes. quick. So, let me just, I want to clarify. So, the parent resource building that or, or area we want to do, build or whatever, um, we do not have the area for it yet. It's still being the area that we're planning on doing it. We don't have, um, it's currently being has tenants. We, correct? We, right, it, it, right. We currently do not have the space, but there is one tenant actually um, just uh, moved out, vacated the the suite, um, actually about a week ago. So we're we're looking at you know the possibility of of you know whether that space is adequate enough to uh, adequate to serve as a as an interim um, center, is the immediate need for uh, to provide uh, that facility for that space. Because honestly, I feel like I would, I don't feel, I, even though I know you're saying it's legal for us to use the bond money for this, I don't feel comfortable doing that. And I honestly would much rather use that money towards a parent center instead of a boardroom. But that's just my personal opinion. But thank you. Thank you. Other uh, questions from board members? Yes, um, board member Fuentes. Thank you, uh, Board uh, President uh, Flores. Uh, just a quick question, Owen. Uh, this uh, temporary location that you're looking at for the parent center, is it on the first floor or second or third? Uh, that's going to be on second floor. Second floor, okay. Yes. Uh, and another question is right up above where we have the main district server room, there's a couple of uh, areas that are kind of crossed out with lines. Are those rooms or what are they? Oh yeah, th those are actually um, currently being occupied by uh, other tenants. So eventually when they vacate, those space will be um, ours to utilize. 
Um, there are some adjacent area with a little box that you see that that's uh, the, uh, the the elevator shaft. So, oh, okay. Yeah, some of it are just kind of from graphics to show that the spaces are, are not uh, available for for us to use, at least for and the, the electrical. And that's an electrical room, I assume, that's in the middle there. Yes, yes, that's the existing. Okay. Room. So we'll, we'll and, be, and we'll, also another comment is I'm in agree, uh, agreement with uh, Ms. Haro uh, about the money use. Uh, I agree with her. I think we should use the money uh, for our parent center. I know, I know we're also in need of a boardroom and stuff, but uh, I think a parent center would probably be the best use of that money, the, the, the monies that uh, we have. So that is my comment also. Thank you. If, if I can jump in on that just really quick for president, uh, let me just uh, be, I uh, think, clear that this is really the primary usage is for a staff development center. Uh, this, uh, the board had approved uh, this project uh, way back uh, uh, when actually, when I was the uh, assistant superintendent of business, uh, the board had approved the funds for about 5.1 million approximately, uh, which included a bond fund for a, a staff development center. Uh, and then uh, secondary usage would be a boardroom. Not, that's not the primary usage of this uh, facility. I just wanna be clear about that because that's our primary goal. Uh, this is all about staff development. Uh, and again, uh, in terms of the uh, parent center, uh, we are gonna set up uh, the parent center on the second floor uh, as an interim. And then uh, we are planning a long-term. Of course, it requires uh, uh, strategically because of the leasing involved uh, that we have there. Uh, and so uh, as we get closer to a permanent structure for the parent center and we'll come back to the board again uh i will emphasize this is a, a staff development center for staff we have uh inadequate facilities the district right now only has one uh one room it's called sdc uh and that's really inadequate uh so uh the focus is going back to ensuring that our staff our trainers we have a a, a professional staff development center Thank you, Dr. Miranda. Um, no, I, and, I, and I would agree. Appreciate you you emphasizing that. And and this has been part of our master plan, master facilities plan for some time. You use the word inadequate. I'm gonna I'm gonna be honest. I, I, embarrassing is the word, Dr. Miranda. Uh, we've all been in the training room. This district has utilized for how long? How many decades has that training room, which is makeshift portable building, by the way, in the middle of Colton Middle School? It's, a, it's an embarrassing space to, for our teachers to come together and staff to train. Um, we've made a commitment a long time ago. Uh, and while the emphasis has been classrooms and school sites, which we've done a phenomenal job of, um, beautiful thing is we're not sacrificing improving schools to do these types of facilities. We're able to do it all. But we made a commitment. PPS was what was the first to move out of those, those facilities in Bloomington, which were literally portions of those buildings were red tagged by the fire marshal, they were so substandard. We have so many supportive services staff who don't necessarily work in a classroom, but they deserve clean, safe space. And, and I'll be honest, this is something I'm personally passionate about because I think it's easy to forget about the folks behind the scenes who do so much to help our teachers and our staff um, be successful. And I've been in this district a long time to, to see the portables that are falling apart, um, the buildings that are falling apart, and at some point, it's it's not not only is it not fair, it's not right that we put our staff in those kinds of facilities. So, I, I agree with respect to the boardroom and the usage. We only meet twice a month. Um, we don't have a tremendous amount of need, and I don't think anybody on this board wants anything that's opulent or anything that's over the top for the board. We're very modest in what we need. It needs to be an adequate space. Um, but this is this really should be about providing the training space and the flexibility that's needed. So, Owen, questions that I had, and I think you've answered most of it is, I wanna make sure this space is as flexible as possible, that we don't have fixed podiums and fixed tables for the board meetings that make it difficult to really use it for its primary purpose, which is training and meetings. So other than the diet, are all the other uh, identified tables and podiums, are those um, movable? Are those flexible? Seats are flexible, nothing else is fixed? 
that, that is correct. There's there's nothing fixed. There are some rooms that are flanking either side of the boardroom. We're actually working with edge services to talk about how to best utilize those. One of the things ideas thrown out is make a green room to do uh, video productions for teaching and training. So there's really some exciting ideas that are, are being uh, provided. And this is uh, primarily main focus is provide staff development center with board use as a secondary uh, intent. Use. Will will this space also be available? Uh, you know, if say for example, ACE or CSA needed to have a space, a larger space to hold a meeting, um, to do their own training, would would that space potentially be available for that as well? Yes, definitely. Okay. Um, and will this replace um, our training center that's currently at twelve twelve Valencia over Colton Middle? I'm sorry, we you, that's a question for you, Dr. Moran, because you already ref referenced that space, which is woefully inadequate for what our needs are. But, um, again, I, I think, will this replace that and either allow for another use or? or uh, Absolutely. Yeah, okay. And, and let me, yeah, I just wanted to add something that uh, when the board uh, approved the, uh, the uh, Staff Development Center here at 1212, we allocated about 750,000 uh, for that project. That's all we're using. We're not, we're not uh, using more than that uh, uh, of those funds. So it's a very minimal. And perhaps it might be helpful, Dr. Miranda, if you could send uh, to us either an email board correspondence, the budget breakdown for sources of fund for this particular project. It's been part of the facilities master plan for a little while, but maybe it, it helps to have an updated um, budget breakdown on this and where the source of funds are coming from. So, so, Miranda, thank, thank you. Thank you for the that explanation. Uh, now, now it's understandable. Uh, it's just one of my concerns is not, not the boardroom or the staff development center. It's just uh, the temporary parent location. If, if there was a way to make that a permanent location, because once we're going to spend some money on that just to get it to where it needs to be for the parents, I don't want it to be something just kind of like a temporary box with a couple chairs and tables, you know, parents are going to start getting used to it. If, if that's going to be something that we're going to have for six, maybe a year or two, you know, let's do it right the first time and let's get it done right the first time. I understand it'll be on the second floor and I understand we're looking for an adequate space for it. But if that space that we're looking at for the temporary location can be used and just keep it, uh for the parent location uh parent uh staff or uh, the parent uh room uh that would be uh you know just the use of our monies just to use them right and uh again thank you for the clarification on the amount i i, I thank uh, president flores for also sent getting uh you to send that to us uh breakdown of it uh and uh, i was going to ask about the amount and uh, you did tell us it was seven hundred fifty thousand. so I appreciate that. So that that does clear it up a little. So yeah. In terms of the parents, just a point is, uh, uh, what we could do is um, come back and board correspondence uh, and provide more details in terms of what that looks like. So uh, appreciate and, that. Uh, given each board of board members of what we're looking at uh, in in the interim, uh, we don't want to make it permanent because we have bigger plans for our for our parents. Uh, uh, you know, it's subject to. Uh, we want the best for for our parents, and I understand. Absolutely. That. Uh, yeah, so we yeah, and we we do have some we have some ideas and some great ideas to give our options uh, some space, uh, and staff for meetings and things. So, so we're excited about the opportunities. There's a lot of opportunities in this, these buildings, and so uh, definitely moving in the right direction. Uh, with, Thank you. Uh, yeah. So. We'd be more than happy to share that. And of course, the budget too, uh, regarding that. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. President Flores. Yes, please. Uh, I, you brought up a good, uh, a good point as far as, um, you know, we did this initially to begin to move PPS over there. And it was also to move student services over there as well. And the rest of the staff that is currently over at the old at the Hermosa Center. Um, we still have staff at Hermosa Center that have not moved over. Um, so 
when you say that you know we want to make sure that everybody's in a quality in, in a in a good location um why aren't we using this time to move them over instead of build this no that, and that's, a, and that's a fair there. yeah no that's a fair question and i i'll let owen answer i think it's only a matter of when the space becomes available due to tenancy but that's a that's a good point because there is a plan uh, Mr. Chang, if I'm not mistaken, to try to move everybody over as the space becomes available, then we can renovate. That's a very good question. That is correct. And, and our, our plan is to consolidate everyone from Hermosa to 1212 into one centralized location. And and, and some of the the um, limitations that we have to, or constraints that we have to work with that are, are the uh, some of the leases that we have to wait for the space to vacate before we're able to, to take occupancy of that space. And you know, it may, and again, board member Hall brings up a good point. It probably warrants, um, in addition to the information you're already going to send to us, Dr. Moran and Owen. Um, I mean, we have a uh, timeline, I think, or and a map of sort of the layout of the building and when we think, as tenants leave, we renovate and then bring in the the staff for those relative spaces. Maybe if you could share that again with us, or or an updated timeline of when we think these folks will be able to move over, because. Um, we have a number of folks that are still at their original uh, sites that do need to move over as the space becomes available. Is that, is that something you can provide to us? Yes, definitely. And, and on a, also on a, a, another important factor it is the the financial commitment, obviously, to renovate the rest of the building. It's uh, it's going to um, you know, require some some uh, investment as well. So we are looking at some uh, some resources um, and, and RDA. Of funding in particular, and to look at that as a uh, as a source of funding to pay for the improvements to uh, the consolidation uh, to the staff. So that's another important component that we're looking at. Thank you for that. Um, other questions, comments, board members. Well, I know, um, Chang, you referenced looking to get consensus to move forward with the, the next steps of this particular space. Um, I think you're looking at moving forward with the design and technical documents that will lead into the um, review that's required by both DSA and the city of Colton. So uh, you're looking simply then for cons consensus from the board to be able to move forward with that next step? Yes, that's correct. Okay. All right. Well, I will ask then if there is a, a consensus amongst the board members to allow our uh, Mr. Chang and his team to move forward with the design and technical documents and then be able to submit those to uh, the city of Colton and state DSA for review and approval. And again, that's something in a, that's between a, the design is three to four months and the review will be another two months. So we're probably anywhere from five to six months out to see that uh, those next two phases so there's time plenty of time to get information and bring this um updates back to us correct yes yes board member flores can i ask mr chang one more question then yeah please absolutely um owen uh so if we give the okay to just go forward with the plans and sending it to dsa um are those plans when they come back whether like six months or whenever they come back how long are those also good for like the two years or the three years whatever it is yes the is it's valid for for four years oh four years okay yes okay so we're we're not locked into building it or doing it right away is what i'm asking uh, okay thank you yeah. yeah the only thing i have to check with is the city of colton city of colton is actually the the the, the main uh, approving uh your have a shorter time frame uh so i'll i'll verify and include that in the board correspondence i believe it's it if I don't remember correctly i think they may be limited to like 12 months or 18 months i think they have a lot shorter duration oh they have a shorter time okay yes for city fulton yes why is that is uh, it's just a different different agency um in, in rules but I can okay. confirm that with the uh, with the city. All right, thank you. Thank you, Your Honor. Um, 
Yeah. And that well, that, and that's a good good point. That allow us to. Um, I think it's probably prudent to bring back the, this particular the plan for this building, and the various phases and and projects that we are looking at on. Because as you can tell from the board, we want to be smart about how we prioritize the investment. And as we start to um, move folks into the building, that we're making sure that we're moving our staff in as you know as quickly as possible and. Um, making smart investments, so that'll give us time to do that as well. Yes. Okay. Great. If we can do the board, uh, board president, I just will add again that this is part of the facility master plan. So this was actually next on the list uh, as the board. But of course, we 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 have time uh, to uh, bring back more information to the board and and uh, make a prudent decision on next steps. But uh, giving consensus today does not lock us in. Uh, board member Haro uh, stated very uh, uh, adequately here. Yep. So. No, I think that's great. I think that it's a, it's, a, it's been a little bit uh, since we looked at that master plan with related to the Washington Street um, site, the campus. And I know we've had some leases renew. We've had some some tenants give notice of vacancy. So we're starting to get some of those timelines locked in. So I think it's time to re revisit this and have a. Um, a conversation so but i would ask if we could provide own the consensus to move forward with the design and technical um drawings that are required and to build to dsa and the city of colton more prayer in the forest i'm oh, sorry yeah. be a pest i have one more question mr yeah Chair. no please i just thought of it um so when we were talking about the rest of the people over at hermosa and you said that we what uh, what i want to know is um because we're to me, that's more important getting those people out of there. Um, but my question to you is, um, we don't have the area now right at, at this time to renovate or whatever and move them into. Um, do you have any kind of timeline? Or if you don't, can you get that to us? What kind of timeline we'd be looking at possibly if tenants move out or whatever um, to be able to take care of them first? Yes, definitely. Uh, I'll, it's a little bit of a, a puzzle. There's a lot of kind of, like, I'll have to look at the time okay. to get information to boys, look at the timeline when spacing will be vacant. And we also have to look at the cash flow when we can expect a certain amount of cash to do the necessary improvements. Okay. I th Thank you. If you could let us know that in board correspondence, when you send us the other information, if you could, I'd appreciate it. Thank you. Definitely. Thank you. Thank, thank you for that board member, Harlow. Um, all right. Well, again, I'll ask if there is consensus to uh, allow Dr. To me, allow Mr. Uh, Chang to proceed with the design and submittal of documents for review with DSA and City of Colton. Do we have consensus to do that? Yes, I do. Yes. 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 Is there a point this? Okay. All right. And uh, sounds like we have a consensus, Dr. Miranda and Owen, to go ahead and move forward with the next uh, next phases for this uh, staff development center slash boardroom. Thank All right. you. All right. All right. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Right. Thank you. Take the comments. Appreciate it. All right. Um, I don't believe we have an ACE update or CSEA or MAC update this evening. Is that uh, correct, Ms. Medina? Okay. Great. So uh, I'll uh, ask if there is an ROP update, uh, Mr. Barra or Ms. Saro. Yes, there is. A, we did meet yesterday, a rare one o'clock meeting, and that was due to other uh, board members having graduations this week. And uh, we did have a presentation, uh, and it was a teacher in, uh, introduction program, which uh, uh, the acronym is TIP. Uh, the presentation was geared toward new teachers, and. Uh, it's a two-year program that's available to all CTE teachers, uh, not only through ROP, but through all the three districts. Uh, the idea is to prepare our, uh, our new teachers to, uh, to be ready to uh, manage and teach in the classroom. Uh, some of the topics that they, they indicated that they taught was basics of teaching, uh, classroom management, they had a variety of guest speakers and uh, it was well presented and it appears to ha be a very, very popular program. They did indicate that I believe uh, six of 
Cone Joint Unified School District uh, teachers have completed the two years and graduated from that program. So uh, that was uh, their major presentation. And uh, if uh, you want to add anything to that, Pat, uh, please feel free to do so. No, thank you, Mr. Ibarra. Okay. So that's it, Dan. Great. Thank you for that. We appreciate it, uh, Member Ibarra. That takes us to Superintendent's Communique, Dr. Miranda. All right. Let me get back on camera here. There we go. Thank you, Board President. Uh, good evening again, everybody. And uh, just uh, excited uh, to uh, uh, do the communique tonight. Uh, I have a short uh, communique. Uh, first, I want to start with uh, our summer meals program. So we get to the next slide, please. So uh, every year we do this. Uh, again, I'm extremely excited and thrilled uh, to announce that, again, we're offering meals to our communities, uh, the, to the public at the different uh, sites that we have open. So the three sites uh, that are open for the summer are Joe Baca Middle School in Bloomington area, Veterans Park, and the Gonzalez Center in Colton. Uh, so uh, the program is free to all people uh, 18 and under. Uh, and meals may be picked up on behalf of, uh, of the student. Uh, and so there, uh, no identification is required to uh, receive these free meals for, uh, again, for 18 year olds or, or below or for the students. Uh, and so at this, again, wanna thank our uh, amazing nutrition services uh, department and, and the staff, the leadership under uh, Eric and CISO and Victor and Mindy uh, for all the work that they're doing uh, of, to put this together and provide this uh, service to our students and community. Uh, so next slide, please. And this was mentioned earlier, uh, just uh, again, so thrilled uh, and just so happy to uh, offer our elementary summer camp. Uh, so we had over uh, or approximately 900 elementary students uh, and we also had middle school students start on Monday uh, to in-person, I'll say it again, in-person summer school. I know we had some board members out there visiting some of the sites, so it was nice to see all of you. Uh, and so we're offering uh, the elementary summer school uh, at different sites. Uh, so we have the Bloomington and Fontana cohort schools. Uh, so, uh, at Zimmerman Elementary, uh, we have uh, students from Crestmore and Zimmerman attending there. At Sycamore Hills, we have DRC, Harupa, Vista, and Sycamore, uh, Sycamore Hill students uh, attending that, obviously. And then Lewis uh, is also one of our sites for summer camp, as we're calling it. And we have students from Grimes, Lewis, and, and, and Smith who are attending that and, uh, in the Colton cohort. Uh, we're offering uh, it uh, the summer camp at Bernie Elementary. Uh, Bernie, uh, Lincoln, and Wilson students are attending that uh, cohort. And so at Grant, we also have Grant uh, that is uh, a site for summer school. And we have the McKinley students and the Rogers students who are uh, attending there. And then finally, at, the, at Grand Terrace, uh, the Grand Terrace cohort is being offered at Cooley. Uh, and so we have the Ritchie Can Canyon students that are going there and also Grand Terrace Elementary. We have the Terrace View uh, students attending there. It was just, uh, I'll just add that it was executive cabinet. Uh, we were out there uh, visiting the sites on uh, Monday and Tuesday and just to see our students back in person. Uh, the buses, uh, uh, I love what Ms. Adigin said about the Twinkies uh, rolling around, but it was just, Exciting to see the students. They would they they look so uh, amazing in the classrooms, getting the instruction uh, and walking around. The sites looked amazing. I just want to thank uh, staff, uh, especially our Ed Services uh, team, for putting this together. Uh, it's great to have in-person uh, students again. It brought back our, our our why why we're here, and that is to service our students. Uh, so very very. Uh, thrilled and excited to see our little ones back and our bigger ones too. So, uh, and then last slide, if um, I may, I always like to end with uh, hashtag CGSD cares. 
uh, because we do care about not only our students, our community, our employees, everybody, the CGSD family. Uh, so I, I just uh, want to wish uh, all our teachers, our administrators who just went off on summer break, uh, just uh, not all administrators, because I know the high school administrators are still on until uh, you know the end of the, the month here. But just wishing all of you a restful break. You deserve it. Uh, you've been resilient. You've worked hard. It's been uh, uh, just a, a challenging time, unprecedented time. And so I wanted to thank all of you for your resiliency. Uh, and I want to re reiterate to all of you that family comes first. So please spend time with your family. Uh, take time to rest, uh, to do some self-care, uh, and to uh, uh, just uh, get that balance back, if you will, to some degree. Uh, we know all of you have worked really, really hard to get through the year. You've finished strong, and we're going to start strong, too. Uh, so, uh, again, take time to decompress uh, and to just enjoy your families and, and have fun. Uh, so, again, thank you from the bottom of my heart. On behalf of the Board of Education and Executive Cabinet, uh, just thank you to all staff. Thank you to all our, our teachers, staff across CGSD. Uh, for uh, your dedication this year. Uh, it's been uh, uh, no, uh, a year like no other, and, and I'll tell you, uh, can't wait to get back. Uh, you see the plan for when we come back uh, for the first eight. Uh, so with that, uh, uh, just again, thank you. That thank you and thank you to all of you for your hard work and dedication. So let me turn it back over to you, Board President. Thank you for that, Dr. Miranda. We appreciate the update. This takes us to a board member comment portion of the meeting. And we will begin with uh, board member Ibarra. Thank you, Dan. Um, with uh, the end of the, the year here, and we're already starting our summer vacation, I'd like, just like to take this opportunity to thank all the principals, teachers, uh, support staff that made our graduations a wonderful event. Um, I saw as I was giving out uh, the graduate, uh, the, the diploma packets, uh, and even with the masks, um, each one of us uh, board members can see the smiles in the eyes of each one of the students coming up. And you could tell that they really appreciated and enjoyed the moment uh, that uh, they were going through. And I think that uh, that that it, that joy makes a big, big difference in their lives. And uh, I just want to make sure that every one of those who were responsible for having a, a, and holding their own individual graduations, whether it be at Cone High School or at the 66 er Stadium, uh, understand that they did a wonderful job uh, in putting it all together. And I truly appreciate it. And I appreciate uh, our superintendent as well as the other board members uh, for, for just supporting all the students, supporting all the employees of the district through this whole school year. As uh, we've said many, many times, it wasn't the easiest of school years, but uh, there's something uh, special about Cone Joint Unified School District that uh, everyone, everyone comes, uh, rises to the top when things get tough. And uh, it definitely, definitely showed this year. So uh, I take my hat off to all those individuals who, uh, did a wonderful job. Can't say enough about that. And just like uh, Dr. Miranda, I want to wish everyone uh, a restful uh, summer break. And please take time with your families, your friends, and with yourself to recuperate because when we come back in August, uh, we're going to, just like we showed earlier, it's going to be something very, very special. So we just want everyone to be rested and prepared for that. Uh, with that, I just want to say thank you to everybody once again. 
And that's all my comments for today, Dan. Thank you, Board Member Ibarra. Board Member Thori Nohita. Thank you, President Flores. A couple of things. First of all, before the end of the school year, I was able to go out to Grand Terrace Elementary School and see students in class in person. And I have to say, it looked really good to me. <laughs> really just the little ones, you could tell they were happy to be back to school. Yes, it was still a uh, computer, but they were very happy to be there. And they were so well behaved and ready to come back. And it gave me a vision of how it will be when all of our boys and girls come back this next school year. Graduation. You know, graduation time of the year is always exciting and so busy. And obviously this year was even more so than ever before. I want to congratulate all of our students, our staff and our families for hanging in there through the whole year. Uh, it was difficult uh, for many people in many different ways. I am sad for families who lost members of their family. Uh, I know we have a lot of things to, to help kids with and families through um, next school year, but I have no doubt that again, Colton will rise to the occasion. And I'm really excited about that. And um, we had four graduations in our family. And uh, like families here, we weren't able to attend because of COVID. And it's understandable because we do have to have safety first, like the colleges have had and other high schools have had, but necessary requirements. So congratulations to them as well. I look forward to the beginning of the school year. I love the plan that they've set out for the first eight days. That's exciting to me. And I'm grateful for the counselors that we have in the school district, especially uh, thinking of them as we start the school year and helping to meet the needs of our boys and girls and our staff and our parents. I hope everyone has a wonderful summer. I thank everyone for the hard work they always put in for Colton, for our kids and for us. And you are all appreciated. Thank you very much. All right, thank you for that, Board Member Thorin Ojeda. Uh, board Member Aragin. Yes, thank you. Yes, uh, now we have promotions and graduations now behind us. And uh, as educators working with students, we always, it's our nature to always reflect and think about what went well, what could we do different? Uh, how can we make it bigger and better for next year? Uh, I have to say that, um, you know, the promotions uh, for elementary principals had uh, amazing promotions for their kinders, for their sixth graders. Uh, middle school principals had an, uh, wonderful uh, events for their eighth grade promotion. Um, and the three high schools did an amazing job with their graduations. The kids looked happy. The kids walked tall. The kids walked proud. And uh, a lot of them had their medals around their neck, um, proudly wearing them. Um, and I think, you know, I'm, you know, our, our kids, our seniors are, are gone into the world. They're out there and we, you know, our Titans, our Bruins and our Yellow Jackets are, um, are done with, uh, with their senior year and uh, they're out in the world and I wish them the best. They will succeed. And, uh, Again, thank you to the principals who, who made this all possible and their staff. Uh, again, uh, thank you and um, enjoy your break, teachers, classified, and everyone and you know the students, enjoy your time off. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Board Member Adegin. Uh, Board Member Haro. Yes. <clears throat> Um, like my colleagues, I want to thank everyone for this year. It's been, it was a very tough year for everyone. And the best way I know how to do it is um, on the last day of school, um, I wrote something on social media because I felt it would reach more people. Um, and so I just want to read what I wrote and those will be my comments this evening. Dear CJUSD, I don't even know where to begin with this post. To all our classified staff, teachers, principals, and district staff, my thanks are simply not enough. This school year was like no other. Did we do everything right? No. 
Did we do everything wrong? No. We learned as we went along and did everything possible for staff and students to keep them all safe. No district in this country did it all right. We all did the best we could with data and guidelines that changed on a daily basis. I know in my heart, we did the best we could with the information we were given. I am beyond blessed to be part of a district that was over conscientious about safety for its staff and students. With all my heart, I thank you all for doing the best job you could do during some very, very tough times. Enjoy your time off, relax and rejuvenate. Fill your soul with what makes you happiest. You deserve it. Love your grateful board member. Thank you. Thank you, board member Harrow. Very well said, very well said. Uh, board member Fuentes. Thank you, board president. Uh, first of all, thank you for, for coming out this evening virtually. I know uh, a lot of times it's, uh, even though sometimes virtually it's hard also, but I wanna thank all of our parents and our staff that's out there virtually and uh, listening to our comments and listening to all the good stuff that's gonna happen this opening of our new school year. I'm excited about the F8 plan. I'm calling it the F8 because it's the first eight. I'm excited about that. And uh, I can't wait till we start implementing that and having our students back on our campus. So uh, speaking about students being back on campus, I did have the opportunity to go out to uh, Cooley Ranch and Zimmerman. I was out of Cooley Ranch with uh, Ms. Bertha Adegin. And it was exciting to see these, these little eyes light up as they were walking in. And uh, we were holding signs, you know, rooting them in as they were coming into the school. And to see the parents excited and uh, waving and all of that. So it was a great, great time uh, to see our students back in class, uh, walking through some of the classrooms, the kids, you know, doing their projects, uh, drawing pictures, writing their names, doing whatever the teacher was giving them to do. So it was exciting to see that. I, I am so happy to have students back on campus at our middle and our, our elementary schools. So thank you. I appreciate uh, all the teachers that are working out and uh, doing all of this for our kids. Also, for our graduates this year at uh, Bloomington, at uh, uh, Colton High School, Grand Terrace High School, Slover, and at Washington, congratulations to each and every one of you. Uh, you, you did it, you exceeded, you came, and you have your diploma. I'm excited, I'm excited, and I wanted to thank uh, uh, Thank you for the opportunity to be able to share to our class of 2021 for Bloomington High. I, I am very grateful for the opportunity to share to them. Uh, I'm gonna end my comments today with the, one of the quotes that I uh, read to the class of 2021 for Bloomington High. But before that, I also wanna thank our retiring uh, staff uh, today. Also our recognition, uh, people who received the recognition today, I wanna, uh, congratulate you for receiving those recognitions. But there was one gentleman that's that was recognized today by the name of Santiago Sanchez. Uh, he's one of our head custodians over at Smith Elementary. Uh, and I've had the opportunity to speak to him and talk to him and a great gentleman. He's been with our district for 33 years. And I just want to congratulate him on his retirement too and, and uh, for giving the service that he did. And I know there's many of you who have serviced our district and are retiring that have been here for 30 plus years. And I am so grateful for everything you've given to us. You've technically given your life uh, to our students and uh, those many students that are now probably doctors, police officers, uh, teachers that, that are in our district now. Uh, uh, so I am grateful for each and every one of you. But Mr. Sanchez, congratulations. Thank you for your 33 years of service to Colton Joint Unified. And to those that continue that have been here for a very long time, I'm hoping that one day I can uh, sit down with you, uh, talk to you and hear some of the great stories that have happened here at Colton Joint Unified. Uh, enjoy your summer break. Uh, as my colleagues have said, enjoy it. Take some time, get some rest. We have a great year coming up. The F8 plan is coming and uh, we're gonna make sure that our kids have a successful and a very, very productive year 
I'm excited, can't wait to see all these kids as we come back into our classrooms and we have the in-person learning. Uh, I'm gonna end with the quote this evening. Uh, it says, your life is your story and the adventures ahead of you is a journey to fulfill your own purpose and potential. Kerry Washington. Have a great summer. God bless. God bless you guys. Thank you, Board Member Fuentes. Uh, Board Member Sandoval. Hi. Um, no, there's no comment today. But thank you. Thank you, Board Member Sandoval. Um, I'll be very brief. I, we had an amazing end of the year with respect to the graduations. I want to thank everybody, everybody involved in making our promotions, whether it was a drive through for the little ones or promotion for middle school or graduation for our high school students, uh, inclusive of Washington and um, Slover, which which were phenomenal. Thank you to everyone that helped make that possible. Um, it was an opportunity to celebrate with the students and the families to acknowledge their hard work, their accomplishments. And I can tell you, and looking as Board Member Ibarra alluded to, said, said earlier, looking at the faces of those um, graduates, you could see the excitement. You can understand in hearing the speeches, they know what they endured, they knew the challenges they faced, but they also knew they rose to the occasion and that they're better and stronger for it. And they're a pretty incredible, resilient group. So congratulations to all the graduates, their family members, including Board Member Fuentes, congratulations, one down, one to go. Um, and uh, I want to thank everybody for uh, finishing strong this school year. We look forward to um, a brief summer break and we'll be ready for next year to open in person um, and welcome our families back to our campuses. So with that, uh, we will go ahead and adjourn our open session into closed session. So we will see uh, board members and staff in closed session uh, and we'll just do a quick five minute break if we can. Um, before we get started with closed session. So we'll go ahead and adjourn this uh, open session and we'll see you in closed. Thanks. Thank you, uh, interpreters. You're welcome to leave now. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. And Melody, I'm going to go in and turn my camera off if you need me, just text me. Okay, I will. Thank you. No problem.
Hey, Dr. Peterson. We're back. Awesome. Great, great, great. Okay, I see Ms. Sandoval on. I see Ms. Adikin on. I see Dan Flores on. I see Mr. Ibarra. I see Mr. Fuentes, Ms. Story Nojeda. We're still waiting, Joanne. We're still. I believe we're waiting for Miss Hara. I don't see her. Do you see her, Joanne? I don't see her. Okay. So we got another. Okay. Oh, I think I just saw her jump on. All right. I count uh, seven. Do you? I do. Concur? Okay. Good. Great. All right. Well, we'll reconvene then. The. Uh, Meeting of Columbia Unified School District Board of Education coming out of closed session. We just have one item, item 13.1. This is our personal public employee appointment discipline dismissal release on a motion by board member Fuentes and seconded by board member Thorin Ojeda. Uh, the, the board approved the following uh, two volunteer coaches, football and five volunteers. And that was on a 7 0 unanimous vote. All right, got it. Great. That is the only item uh, read up for uh, closed session. So we are adjourned. Thank you everybody for your time tonight. We covered a lot of ground today. And our next meeting is scheduled for bonus points. July. June 4th. I'm sorry, I'm thinking July already. I'm sorry. <laughs> what was the date again, Dr. Miranda? Uh, June 24th. June 24th. Okay, June 24th. Got it. All right. Thank you, everybody. Have a great evening. Everybody be safe. Good night, everyone. Good night, everybody. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night.